So I'd like to welcome our witnesses. We have Sir Chris Walmold, who's the Permanent Secretary at the Department for Health and Social Care, joined by, from the Department, Matthew Stile, who's the Director General for NHS Policy and Performance. Amanda Pritchard, of course, uh, uh, is Chief Executive of NHS England, and she's joined by Professor Sir Stephen Powers, who's the National Medical Director for NHS England, and a first-time uh, visitor to the committee, Sarah Jane Marsh, who's the National Director of Urgent and Emergency Care and the Deputy Chief Operating Officer of NHS England. So just a little bit on your plate there, Ms Marsh. Um, so welcome to you all. So I wanted to, to kick off, really, to summarising in the headlines of this report that we've seen an increase in staff in places, emergency doctors particularly, an increase in waiting times, an increase in demand, and a drop in productivity overall. So I think perhaps if I start with you, Ms Pritchard, in simple terms, why, with investment going in, are we still seeing a drop in productivity on a long-term trend? Thank you. Um, so uh, great to be here with the committee today. And you're right, this is a really important topic for us to be discussing. But going straight into the question uh, you've just asked. So I think it's worth just saying, of course, what we have seen over not just the period of the pandemic, but uh, since then is record levels of pressure on the NHS. So we've seen one of certainly, I mean, by far and away the worst winter that I can recollect in 25 years working for the NHS, um, but certainly that hasn't stopped uh, with winter, so we've just had the busiest May for A&E attendances ever, yep. and we continue to see pressure not just on emergent, urgent emergency care in hospitals, but in um, GPs as well. So we've just uh, completed 12 months where we've seen 30 million more appointments in primary care than pre-pandemic, so that's just another indication of the level of demand that there is uh, in the system at the moment. Uh, so levels of demand outstripping anything we've had before. Second point worth mentioning is we've also got a population that is older and more complex and generally also sicker. One of the things that we've is... Been, to be fair, the population's been older and more complex yeah. for some time. That hasn't just happened uh, recently. No, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. That's a trend that's continuing, but of course that trend does continue. And what that has led to, um, uh, we've seen very clearly now, is an impact in the length of time people are in hospital. Now, some of that is to do with difficulty in always getting people discharged to the right place at the right time, but some of it is also a reflection of the level of complexity and particularly some of the age profile of patients who are in hospitals at the moment. I'm sure Steve can say more about that if helpful. But just to bring that to life for the committee, um, you know, versus pre-pandemic, we've got almost 3,000 people a day in hospital who've been there more than 14 days. So that's a significant additional uh, length of stay, if you like, uh, that we're seeing for patients in hospitals. Third thing worth saying is um, COVID hasn't ended. So it's nothing like, of course, the peaks of acute pressure that we saw back in 2020, 2021. Uh, but nonetheless, even today, we've got about 1,000 people in hospital with COVID. And some of them would have been there anyway. But even for those who are in hospital who might have otherwise been there, they are more complex. They do require particular care to be taken around things like infection control uh, to make sure that they're well looked after. Um, and the other impact of COVID that we've still got is on our staff. So I know we're going to talk a bit about staffing as we come through today hopefully um, but you'll have picked up I'm sure that we're seeing higher levels of sickness from our staff uh, than pre-COVID some of that uh, we see particularly in mental health conditions and anxiety some of that is directly related to what people have been through over what was an extraordinarily difficult few years uh, but some of that is also respiratory conditions one of which is COVID so actually that continues to have an impact directly on our staff I've mentioned already discharge and flow and a lot of the challenge which is and we'll today, come on to a lot flow. of this, exactly a lot right. of that is related so, you know, net-net, that's an yeah. awful lot that the NHS is dealing with. So you're absolutely right. We've had welcome support, um, particularly now with the support for the workforce plan, which gives hope that we now have a line of sight to a sustainable future staffing model for the NHS, which will be okay, we'll important come just you know, for staff now as well as for those joining us in the future. Okay. But I think the thing... Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, but we are improving. Yeah. So just the, the well, final point to make on your productivity challenge is, you know, we're not certainly not in a position where we're just observing these challenges we are absolutely actively addressing them and that is part of what was behind the publication of the urgent emergency care plan back in January and some of the sustained improvement we've seen since then. Well I think we might have some discussion about that uh, uh, just improvement but I'm going to ask uh, Mr Mark Francois to pick up. Thank you Dame May. 
Uh, Ms. Pritchard, welcome back, and, and your team. Um, you just mentioned the workforce plan, which is highly topical, published on Friday. In fact, the Secretary of State is one minute into his statement about <laughs> it in the House of Commons downstairs in the main chamber. It's an impressive document. It's 135 pages long. There's a tremendous amount of detail in here, except when it comes to finance. There's one paragraph about how it's going to be afforded, which is paragraph 30 and a few bullet points on page 18. So how are we going to pay for this? That's a good question for the Permanent Secretary. Well, you, you can give it to him if you, as you're, but as you're the Chief Executive of NHS England who's actually got to execute it, you, well, you can well, why start. Why don't you start all that? Right. So, so we were absolutely, um, absolutely delighted that the government was clear that they were giving wholehearted backing to mm -hmm. the NHS work for long-term workforce plan. And certainly the Chancellor, the Prime Minister, Secretary of State have all been clear that that is new money that would be going in to support particularly, uh, actually it is the, the full funding of the first five years of education and training place expansion. So uh, that will allow us to go from, for example, 7,500 medics who are currently trained as undergraduate medical students will be up to 10,000 by the time we get to 20, 28, 15,000 by the end of this oh, period. Apologies for interrupting you, but when you say new money, the current NHS budget for England is a bit over £152 billion from memory. That's over three times the defence budget. So you're saying that the money for this plan is going to be over and above that total, yes? Yeah, that's correct. Right. And when does that money start to kick in? So it's, it's phased over the next few years, which is partly a consequence, and Steve, uh, sorry, Professor Powers, I think we should call you that, shouldn't we? Sorry, Steve. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about why that's important, partly because um, trying to make sure that as we bring on additional capacity, most of that, of course, is in higher education mm -hmm. institutions, but that we can then back that up by making sure we've got the right clinical education support uh, in hospitals, in primary care, in other locations in the NHS to make sure that people get a really good quality So, so, so as, as it's a 15-year plan, how much yeah. new money, how much extra money above that which Parliament has already voted, is it going to cost to deliver this plan over the plan period, which is 15 years? So the current government's commitment has been to fully fund the first five years of that plan. And that's going to be what? 2.4 billion? That's correct. So that comes out at about a little under 500 million a year. And you're going to deliver that entire plan for under half a billion pounds, are you? The first o over the five years. Five years. Yes, but that money is, is specifically for the education and training element. But as you'll know, clearly having read the plan, um, that's the bit where there is new yes, significant but no, sorry, commitment, but where there is me. a really It's precisely my question. If the funding. education and training element, which is one part of the plan, yeah. is £2.4 billion over five years, how much does the rest of it cost? So the rest of the plan is a combination of reform and also retention initiatives. Retention at the moment has been enabled by actually other government action, so things like the changes that have been made to pensions arrangements, which allows us then to do things that we haven't been able to do before around particularly people who would otherwise be thinking about stepping away at end of career. So we've got, for example, a particular scheme now to encourage uh, consultants who might otherwise leave completely to consider staying with us to do outpatient appointments. Also but this, is, this, isn't, but this isn't answering way. Mr. I do apologise for cutting you across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, so I don't want to appear rude to anyone, but the nature of the beast is we always have limited time. So I, I, I am sorry. But if it's going to be 2.4 billion over five years just for the training piece, are you saying that all the other initiatives in this plan, it's 135 pages, this is not a small or unambitious document, that all of those other initiatives in this plan are ultimately going to be revenue neutral and you can do all of it for a net 2.4 billion over five years? Is that what you're telling us? 
That is the that is absolutely the basis of the calculations that went into then the conversations that we've been having about the financial support required. There is other support required to allow those other bits to. Yeah, there's none of that other support is costly too. The yes, time for yeah. someone to train it's, someone. It, it, quite. So there's so there's ah. there's co- well there's cost in relation to regulation changes and parliamentary time to approve some of that. And again, permanent sector might want to say a bit more about that. There's cost in relation to the time it takes higher education institutions to stand up additional uh, curricula and things like that. But in terms of the actual kind right, of okay. pound so per training place, so that's where the big so money is. So what's the total cost for the NHS then? So in, in direct Because, because cost, some, people, some people might say there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors going on here, so perhaps the Chris could help us. Yeah. Well, can I be absolutely no, well, clear? The cost to the NHS has been fully backed by government, and it is that 2.4 billion that we've just been talking about. But there is other non-financial enablers that are critical to enable us to do the other parts of the plan. Yeah, I think I think the key to your question is the time period, isn't it, that you're getting? Uh, getting well, it's the amount and it's yeah. the two. So, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so what the government has done is on the existing budgets of the NHS, we have worked out what is the addition of uh, uh, this plan, which is what's set out in the plan of the money that. Uh, 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 Ms. Pritchard has uh, quoted. Uh, in future periods, uh, there are decisions uh, for the government to take about what the total size of the NHS budget is, which will need to take account of the consequences of um, uh, uh, the plan. But those are future decisions for future spending reviews. And I don't think there's any smoke and mirrors here. I think the Chancellor was very clear about right. that. So, that so, when okay, he so it could end up costing it could end up costing a lot more because one of the challenges that the that the NHS and the department faces, and we will explore this in other aspects as well, is that your budget keeps going up and up and up and up. We are already at record peacetime levels of taxation, and there must be some point beyond which the taxpayer can't go. So the reason we're pressing you hard on this, there's there's a method to it, is we're a bit concerned that the true cost of this, because it's so ambitious, is going to be far higher, and we may get to a point where, as a nation, we simply can't afford it. Um, well, I mean, what um, the um, uh, uh, the future budgets of DHSC uh, and indeed the NHS beyond this spending review are obviously uh, political uh, decisions for the future, uh, which will, of course, have to be informed by all the factors. Uh, you, uh, uh, you describe. So, of course, governments and my Treasury friends, uh, and particularly the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, have to take overall decisions about A, what's the overall burden on the taxpayer, and B, what's the division. Well, I'll ask you, then I'll hand back to the Chair, because yeah. lots of colleagues want to ask questions. Yeah. The Secretary of State, your boss, said on the Ridge programme yesterday that this was new money and it would be formally confirmed in the next, quote, fiscal event. Yeah, now he was talking about the direct commitments we've made in the plan for the cash for the training. I think we've been very clear that the future budgets of the NHS uh, in terms of future spending review periods uh, would be settled in the normal, uh, uh, normal way and the government would take decisions at that point both what do you want the total budget of the NHS to be, um, and, uh, and B, how do you raise uh, uh, whatever that uh, uh, sum is, as it were. Now, uh, I think the final thing to say is if this plan is successful um, and we get uh, retention levels up, uh, we are less reliant uh, on um, uh, international recruitment for our uh, NHS, we are using less agency staff, and we are working in the kind of reformed way that the plan sets out. Uh, there are savings there as well as costs. Um, and what both the government and then Parliament, should it approve the budget, will of course want to weigh is what's the last, net effect last of all one. Is there any reference at all in this document to the cost of the plan beyond the five years? Anywhere? But, uh, no, no. I mean, those are future, 135 the, page documents. The, the, those are future decisions for the government, which take account of all the factors that we've just discussed, including the ones that you set out. That's great from an NHS perspective. From a taxpayer perspective, it's quite worrying. Um, Blame me. Well, no, sorry. I'm just, I mean, just to be clear, I mean, the the, um, uh, the the government does spending reviews in the way that it does. And that is transparent both to the par- Parliament and the taxpayer. And of course, what 
as I say, both the overall burden of taxation and the investment in the NHS should be you know, debated at the time. Yeah, but, but the point is, if there's a plan that's going to be delivered over 15 years, I think Mr, Mr. Francois is uh, spot on, but well, yeah. without knowing... As I say, there are a lot of decisions need, to be taken which will define well, the Well, if the NHS decision was made not to fund it any further, then the plan would not be delivered for well, you know, extremists. Okay, so Geoffrey, give around briefly and then I'll come to... So, I've been listening, uh, 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 Sir Chris, very carefully to Mark... Uh, Francois's excellent questions and I am still not clear what the taxpayer is getting for their 2.4 billion pounds so can we try and see if we can find some clarity on that does that 2.4 billion pounds provide us with a doubling of medical school places by 2031 32 um, I might leave um, uh, my NHS colleagues okay. to uh, uh, answer but on that one yes yes nice. is the answer so, by by which date so the plan sets out a doubling of medical school places by 2031 to 100% increase. Does it, does it give us that? So the funding is till 28. 29. It doesn't buy us all So that. the 31 date, that's, sorry, that's why I was just trying to clarify exactly which date we're talking about, it takes us beyond the funding period we're discussing. It gives us a 25% increase in medical school places from 7,500 to 10,000 over the first five years. It's really helpful, Professor. And then once they started, they have to continue in that. So there's kind uh, of uh, clearly those ten thousand do the the doubling, which would be up to fifteen thousand, is for the remaining ten years, uh, obviously subject to additional funding. Um, I think it would take um, it, the education sector five years to build up to that number, uh, which is back to the phasing question. So the money will need to be phased because it will require new medical schools. It will require expansion of existing uh, medical school places in existing medical schools. That doesn't happen overnight. We need additional trainers, additional educational staff. That's why uh, the 2.4 billion, I think, uh, when it comes to medical schools, and obviously you could make the same argument for other professions, will will be um, loaded towards the back end of those years. So, Professor, I suspect, allied to that answer, does it buy us a near doubling of adult nursing training places by 2031 too? Uh, yes. It, uh, um, it buys from, so we train large. roughly 30,000 nurses at the moment. It would take it up to 40,000 by 2028. And then by the end of the period, so that's actually a bit uh, further on, would get up to 50, about 54,000. Okay. Does it buy us a 40% increase in dentistry training places? Uh, the answer is going to be similar to all of these, which is it, it's a step by 28, and then it's a further step beyond that. And what does it do? You've, you've said in the report a 15-year period uh, would estimate that without action, a shortfall of 260,000, 360,000 staff by 2036, seven by the end of the plan. How far do we get into that, addressing that shortfall? So that's a, that's a calculation across the whole 15 years. So this obviously, again, because it ramps up and it takes a while to train people, they'll be, they'll be coming uh, through their training over the course of that 15 years, which is why the plan is so important that it includes also the commitment to retention. Whether we've said over the period it'd be uh, 130,000 staff that we would seek to retain in the NHS that we would otherwise lose. It's also why the commitment to new roles and to skill mix changes so important because some of those training courses are quicker and they allow a multidisciplinary team with the right skills in place to be able to look after a patient's needs in a in the right way and in a different way and it's also why I've, I've totally understood the answer to that question but never mind I'll look at the transcript and finally what does it do to help retain uh, 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 and deal with absences and sickness in the existing staff because it's no good having all these lofty targets about new staff if you're not retaining the existing staff. Yeah, so that's the number I just gave you where I said that the commitment was that the retention initiatives that are described in the plan we'd anticipate allowing us to retain 130,000 staff in the NHS who would otherwise be leaving us. They'll be likely to leave. Would it help if I gave you some, some more figures for the first five years? Just yes, it would be very helpful. Um, so, so nurse training, again. so first five years, I've talked about medical training places. Uh, nurse training places, yeah, over a third to 40,000 a year. Okay. Nursing associate, uh, associates, 40% to 7,000 a year. Advanced care practitioners grow by 46% to over 6,300. Pharmacy training grow by 29% yep. to 4,300. GP yep, uh, training places will grow from 4,000 to 5,000. Well, we've got, 5, we've got the, the report percent. and the figures, yeah. and that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. A very briefly of Mrs Drummond. Yeah, uh, um, so Mr Prichard, you mentioned sickness and, and mental health. What impact has that got on productivity? So we started off talking about productivity. Um, what, uh, uh, do you record it and, and uh, how, you know, 
what, what impact does it have then on the, on the productivity? Because we said productivity is going down, so where does that fit in? Well, so in that list of things that I gave yeah. at the beginning, there's clearly the impact, the ongoing impact of uh, COVID on our staff, and some of that is physical health, but some of that is also clearly linked to mental health. So we have seen an impact on staff sickness go up. It's one of the reasons why we've continued to support things like um, the mental health hubs for staff, as well as the, all of the local initiatives that are in place to support staff, recognised again, I should say, of course, globally as one of the things that happens post-pandemic. But it, any reason for staff being off sick will have an impact clearly on the ability uh, on their ability to care for patients. But uh, have you actually got a percentage of how much that is affecting productivity, just so that we can see what other aspects are, you know, are impacting on productivity? Um, I, we, I can come back to you with a specific breakdown, if that's helpful, of the contributors to staff sickness. Um, that is the single biggest, that, that and musculoskeletal and respiratory illness are the three biggest reasons why staff are uh, for staff sickness. But I can come back with a breakdown if that's helpful. And, and the mental health angle as well, is that a, a massive issue? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, those are the three big ones for the reason that staff are, uh, tend to be off sick is mental health, uh, musculoskeletal conditions and respiratory conditions. Okay. No, it would be great to have a breakdown yeah, of course. so we can see what impact that is yeah. having. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Nick Smith then. Thank you Chair. Um, Ms Pritchard, I was really pleased to hear that you're hoping to retain an extra 130,000 staff. Having more experienced people uh, looking after patients is absolutely brilliant. But I wasn't clear if the cost of that was part of your 2.4 billion. Yeah, so uh, so the the big elements of the retention uh, uh, package in the plan, and I'm conscious people will have read it, so you don't want to hear me just keep repeating it. But um, I think it's worth saying. Okay, yes or no is fine. Uh, so 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 the, so so it's worth saying that the two big things are about flexibility and it's about continuous career development, as well as actually just knowing you've got enough staff to work with, you've got the right skills to allow you to do your best work. Now, some of that. Um, things like flexibility, as I said earlier, they don't require financial support, but they do require changes costly, and things yeah. like reg <laughs> regular. So do you want to continue? There's a cost, there's a cost to the extra so it's not a new brilliant 130,000 people that are staying on. Not a new on. cost over it above things that are already... So it's not off. in the 2.4 billion? It's, they are, there aren't specific costs associated with those things. So there is a cost associated will with there pension be a cost reform, to but the that's extra retention? No, oh, pardon me? Will there be a, a cost to the 130,000 people you're hoping to retain? So not, a not in a sense that there is a specific number. Uh, what there is is a, is a dependency on a whole number of other things. So part of what allows people to stay, to stay well um, is outside the purview of this plan. So it is to do with, for example, pension changes, which are yeah, 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 not okay. costed okay, so, here. Right. But in terms of specific initiatives, there is confirmed continuous funding for continuous professional development. So that's not new money, but it has been reconfirmed in the plan that that is going to be maintained. So not new, not extra. There is also uh, a clear um, set of things which are where there is a financial cost, but it's been dealt with separately around things like pensions, which are around flexibility. But a lot of what is in the uh, retention section of the plan is about doing what we know works and doing that systematically and supporting that to be spread across the NHS. So, for example, we launched an NHS retention programme last year, 23 trusts are doing it at the moment, and it's a systematic application of the things we know matter the most to people Great. working in the NHS. That's, they've seen their rate of improvement double yep. compared okay. to the rest Thank of the you. NHS. Mr Wormald, have you got an assessment of the extra cost to the Treasury on helping pensions and these retention initiatives, please? Um, there's definitely a cost to the pensions. I don't have it with me unless you do, Matt. I can write to you with the uh, number that was all costed at the budget when it was announced. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, have, you, have you got an order of magnitude? Uh, mm, not off the top of not my head. chunky amount of money, won't it? Yeah, but just, just to be clear, I mean, that was a Treasury tax change costed by the Treasury, so I'll get my Treasury colleagues yes. to send you their uh, uh, costings. Okay. And it's not a cost to the NHS. No, but it's a cost to all of us. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, just a few questions from me on delayed discharge, on process management, and hospital congestion. Uh, uh, first question, please, to uh, Sarah Jane Marsh and Professor Powis. 
Why was the number of patients staying in hospital, uh, despite no longer needing to, higher in the last quarter of 22-23 compared to the same period last year, would you say? To go first, so this is a really important issue to tackle because if we can get people out of hospital in a timely way, it's obviously better for them. Sorry, we we, and it's better for yeah, Yeah. it's better for overall. So we've been doing lots of different things to try to to tackle that. The first is what we can do as an NHS to speed up that uh, discharge process for people. So making sure that they don't need to wait for medications, transport, those types of things uh, when they're waiting to go home. But also working with colleagues in community and in social care for those older people that require more complex discharge packages. Now I know the number that you're referring to is the number of patients in hospital that no longer meet the criteria to reside. That's a number that we really encourage all of our hospitals and teams to really focus and look at every day so that every patient that can possibly leave moves forward. The thing that we're really trying to do is to reduce the amount of time once a person is ready to leave hospital until they actually do. And we've started to see some really encouraging figures there. So there are 7.5% less people staying in hospital over seven days during from January to March um, of this year. We've seen that number come down quite significantly. And we've seen a 3% reduction in people that are staying in hospital for over 14 days. What and that's the, the result of that, the work that we're say? doing for discharge. Just crystallise what the reasons for that were, please, so we can understand it better. The reason for the improvement or the reason for the... <clears throat> Why it was higher in 2023 than the previous year. I think, there's a, I think some of it is to do with the needs of the people, of the population and the complexities and therefore the packages of care that people need to leave hospital with. So we're seeing a need for more and more domiciliary care support, rehabilitation support, as we deal with an older population with sort of underlying chronic uh, conditions. But also as we focus on that and really encourage people to sometimes twice a day be looking at patients in hospital and absolutely challenging whether or not they should be there or not, it's helping us to identify more and more ways that we can improve. So although that num- we want to see that number come down, the most important thing is as soon as someone's been identified to leave, they leave. And that is We've seen some improvements there in the people staying in hospital over a long period of time, but we've got a whole lot more to do on this. Sure. We'll come on to that a bit more soon. Well, well, I think it's also important to remember that the, the quarter four of 21, 22 was also during the pandemic. Uh, the Omicron wave was um, was January of uh, 22, and so I think those periods are actually quite difficult to compare. In some Late respects, charge has been an ongoing issue. For it it absolutely time, has. I'm just putting a note of caution about making comparisons into the the years when we had waves of COVID, because I think restrictions in place, health seeking behaviour was a bit different. Uh, I think those are hard comparisons to make. There's a cost to patients mm, about absolutely. all of this, isn't it? Because mm. being in hospital when you're well mm. is bad for you. Yeah. So uh, what are you doing to uh, minimise the adverse effects on patients of delayed discharge? Ms. Marsh? For patients in hospital, it's really making sure that we are focusing on their rehabilitation while they're in hospital so people don't, what we call decondition, so becomes more unwell while they're there and therefore need to leave with a higher sort of package of support than that, what they would otherwise have done if they'd have left on time. So our therapy, our nursing workforce in our hospitals and our community hospitals are really focused on that and optimising people so that as soon as they're ready to leave, they can go into the right short-term package for them to get them back living the best life that they can. Is that working? I think that is. We've got some really great examples of that working across the country. Is it working across the country? In most places across the country, we have seen significant improvements. There's always more to do. You'll be aware of, of the sort of variation. So one of our roles is to really bring together places where this is working really well and people have got new models, particularly in the community, of looking after people. We call it intermediate care, where people have got that timely intermediate care. Uh, it does bring people out of hospital, but it's really good for the taxpayer overall because it reduces the number of people who subsequently need to go into longer term and longer term care packages in nursing and resi- residential care. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, it's also important to know. I mean, this uh, this number. I mean, it peaked in January. Uh, it's been coming down. Uh, I think we're down from fourteen thousand uh, delayed discharges to about twelve thousand. Uh, a component, but not all of that. Um, I think 
we can reasonably certainly uh, directly relate to uh, the additional investments that the government has made in uh, uh, in social care. Um, I think we all think that's not good enough. We would want to see the number uh, quite a long way down uh, from uh, there. So we've got a lot more to do and a lot more to make the most of the quite large additional investments that the government is making further in social care and uh, that is good yeah so i think if i can ask another question and we all support that it's brilliant but there was an nao study just a few years ago which said on delayed discharge about a third of the issues that needed to be addressed were in the community were about domicile about were about two thirds about two thirds Uh, yeah uh, uh, sorry looking at delayed discharge uh, uh, the study said that about a third of the issues were related to what's going on in the community, what's going on with domiciliary care, uh, what's going on with uh, social care. However, two thirds of the problems around delayed, delayed discharge belonged actually in hospitals. And so give us some comfort, uh, Ms. Marsh, that those two thirds of the problems around delayed discharge, which are the responsibility of hospitals, are being addressed in hospitals. I don't, I don't think that's the correct figure in terms of the balance between uh, between what's the responsibility of the hospital and broader. But I think well, what, what would you say was what then? we're working on here, I mean, what, what is about 20% of the uh, issues with people not able to leave hospital are directly related to something that okay. that hospital itself right. could have done. Study, okay. But that's still that's still 20% no, too, too many. So we work really really hard inside the organisations on what are some of the things that will enable people to go more quickly. So being able to get the diagnostic test at the time that they need it, their medicines when they're ready, their transport when they're ready to go. We've got a team of people uh, that we work work alongside in NH- NHC and that go out to the places with the biggest challenges and really test them. So every single part of this needs to come together and you know make improvements if we're going to bring this number down overall. And I think from an NHS perspective for that 20%, we're absolutely committed that we will continue to see those improvements. Thank you for that answer. Uh, uh, Professor Powis, I understand we're running together on Wednesday for the 75th anniversary of the NHS. Looking forward to it. <laughs> we'll be able to take this session forward to that. Uh, I wonder if you could help me, please. Uh, uh, what do you think are the main problems and where are the main blockages, coming back to the earlier remarks by, from Ms Marsh, which prevent the smooth movement of patients between services? Well, I think, and I think this is a bit of this is described in the report, um, you have to think of the the whole urgent and emergency care pathway as a sort hospitals of single are congested flow. very often. Yeah. So yeah. so if we can't discharge patients from hospitals, that means that we have running high occupancy rates. It means it's hard to get patients who are waiting in the emergency department uh, into the into beds in the wards. If our emergency departments are full, uh, it's hard to get patients from ambulances in the forecourts into the EDs. And if the ambulances are stuck on the forecourts, they can't get out to respond to the new calls and that means that ambulance response times increase so and the figures in the report yeah and so what you see is a whole set of pinch points um and and the first thing that we would expect to happen as we start to decongest that which is what's been happening uh, since the winter particularly bad winter is that the first thing is that those pinch points start to reduce a bit uh, and therefore there are fewer people uh, the fewer ambulance handover delays and that's what we, we've seen um, uh, that you are able to move patients uh, from emergency departments uh, into uh, wards quicker. Um, so, so I, so what what is happening in one part of the um, of the of that particular flow has a direct impact on the other part. And the other thing I just say on this, we spent a lot of time over the winter working with our staff. Uh, because if you're on the ward, what's happening in the ambulance service isn't immediately obvious. But changes that you can make on the ward, such as taking a, an additional um, patient, such as flexing the rotors on the ward, uh, will allow patients to come onto the ward. It will release ambulances. So one of the things that we worked very hard with, particularly systems that were that were particularly struggling, was to spread this this concept of spreading risk so that the the system is working in the pathway as a whole rather than just focusing on one bit of it but but it you have to focus on everything but if we can't get patients as you've just rightly said out uh in uh discharged on time then it does have a knock-on effect all the way down to ambulance response times it is complicated isn't it we do get that miss marsh have you got good metrics that you use to measure the movement of these process within hospitals so we understand where the 
pinch points are, as the professors identified, to try and improve. In, or, in, yeah. is it, would it be in a sort of Fordian way uh, 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 how best uh, patients often in great discomfort if they've been in A&E for a long time or really needing to have that image taken to properly understand the problem. What metrics do you use yeah, so, to, so to understand that? We've got metrics that we look at nationally. I think really important that these are looked at within the organisations themselves so people are constantly tracking patients through. And we look at, as Professor Powers has said, we look at handover delay, we look at the amount of time that people are in the department before they're seen treated and discharged. We look at long waits in an A&E department, so people that are waiting uh, for 12 hours or more. We look at length of stay for short-stay patients, so the sorts of patients we wouldn't expect to get a delayed discharge. We look at length of stay overall we look at the length of time that people are staying beyond being ready to leave all hospitals will have an operation centre of some description where they themselves will be monitoring that information and data and as Professor Powers has said they'll be looking to see can we open an extra sort of ward here or can we move some patients there can we spe speed up some people's scans to get things moving more quickly in some of our organisations, we've got electronic bed management systems, and we're looking to introduce those in more places um, during the course of this year, so people can see in real time some of this information, because the more we can create that flow and the sense of moving everybody through their journey, positive step every day, the better position we'll be in. It sounds really fine-tuned and is. demands a lot, a lot of local care and attention in these operation centres you talk about. You didn't quite answer my question about have you got good metrics to do it. How, how many of these places where you talk about electronic management, how many of those are in place at the moment? So there's only a handful of organisations at the moment that have got fully functional electronic bed management systems, but many places have got the functionality to be able to do that, and we're working with those at the moment to make sure that the functionality and the sort of the way the hospital operations centre works come together. So exactly how many? At the moment, there's only four places that we feel have got the... Uh, the sort of all of the component parts to make a first class electronic bed management system but we're working with a series of organizations particularly those that we're m more concerned about coming into the winter period to make sure that we can increase that number and then increase it sort of year on year but that doesn't mean that in the everywhere else that people haven't they'll be doing it off uh, different electronic systems or more sort of electronic whiteboards and so on Every hospital tracks patients through. Every hospital knows if there are ambulances waiting outside, if people have been waiting a long time in A&E, if there are people that are, you know, in a discharge lounge that need to go home before the discharge lounge shuts. That's the way that hospitals are managed sort of day in, day out. If I, if I may, just on the question the of metrics, Mr start. Smith, um, one of the measures set out in the uh, recovery plan is an improvement in the metrics uh, around discharge, which we've, we've just been touching on. So we are developing a new measure which looks in much more granular uh, detail, so we'll know not only the number of patients who are in a hospital bed who don't need to be there, be there but how long uh, that discharge has been delayed by. We'll be able to match that data at local authority level. Uh, that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's an increase uh, in the sort of transparency that will be an increase in the transparency it's a more granular metric that will allow us to better understand the nature of the problems and better target our action to um, uh, better target our action to address them and that metric will be published ahead of the winter okay, Mr. Smith. ahead of the winter okay thank you for that Mr Starr uh, uh, Mr Wormald um, which which parts of the urgent care system uh, uh, do you think the department uh, sees as the highest priority for actions and investment to help your colleagues here deal with this um, I think our views, well, I mean, we work uh, incredibly closely with the people to my uh, right, and I don't think our views would differ from the uh, uh, NHS's uh, at all. I mean, the, uh, the heart of the system going into winter uh, is less components of the system, but which local systems, and Sarah Jane's just been talking about this, uh, worry us uh, most, which goes back to your metric uh, questions. So and Sarah Jane will be able to describe this uh, much better than I. There were a series of national metrics where we identify which local systems are the most challenged the NHS puts those into tiers and it um, uh, then matches its intervention to those tiers so the places we are worried about and we talk about this um, I'm not sure how many times a week at least three times uh, a week is which are the lo the whole local system that we are most worried about and what are the interventions going on uh, in that system when you look at that analysis and I'll say Sarah Joan we ought to do this in much more detail 
um, it goes exactly to your point about how do the services fit together. So it's, uh, so it's the whole system through arriving in an ambulance to leaving in discharge and working out what is the weak links in those system at a local place level and then addressing those. So what we're not saying is it's ambulances nationally or it's urgent and emergency care nationally, etc. We're saying it's these particular places. Now, how, how many places will you all... Can we do it through the chair, please? Yeah, so, no. oh, sorry. Yeah. You've just been added, I was going to say a hospital pass from my rugby days. There are seven systems across the country where we're worried about lots of different component parts of the urgent and emergency care pathway, so the, amb the ambulance response time, the way that people wait in the emergency department, and then some of the issues that they may be having with uh, delayed discharge. So we work more closely with those seven places than others, but that's not to say that they need to do different things, yeah. it's just sometimes they need a little bit of extra help and support from us to be able to, to, be able to do that. Okay. Uh Thank you, Chair. That's me finished. But I look forward to our run together, <laughs> Professor Powers, on Wednesday. Can I just go back to the electronic bed management system? Yes. So there's four mm. in England. Uh, uh, you say well, four in the country, you mean in England, I'm assuming. I, I think there's four that are completely up to the specification that means that day in, day out, they are able to track okay. in real time there's every patient. Four, four working electronic bed management systems, and you wanted to um, increase that. Is there an, a cost to increasing that? Yeah, so there, can I that just number. clarify, there are four electronic bed management systems that are working in real time and using the particular type of technology that means that at any point in time we know when a bed is become. Yeah. There are lots of other organisations that use electronic data to manage the way they, to manage their beds, but we know our top performing organisation, Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells, they, they use it and they get excellent uh, so so, okay. so we'll just be clear, it, you've, there's this great system yeah. and you're clear yeah. that when it's working well that is actually increasing productivity, yeah. flow, all, the, all those problems we've been talking about. Yeah, so there are 16 right. places uh, or there are 16 trusts in the country where we are going to work to implement the system that we know works right. really well during the course of this year. So who's paying for that? Are they paying for it or is it paid for from NHS England Central Funds or DHSC? The, cost has been, the, co the, the money that has been identified from existing budgets, uh, some of which are NHS England Central and some of which are those trusts, that's, yeah. that's not new money, this no, is no just a way okay. of dependency. So yeah. have you done an analysis of how much you will spend on that and what the benefit will be in productivity terms? Uh, that, part, that's part of the business case, yes. Okay, um, so roughly what's it going to cost? Well. It, I prefer to clarify that. Yeah, exactly right. we, we, Absolutely, that's fine. But, just be just, but the business helpful. case is not yet completely because you've approved, given us some so quite I don't clear answers, Ms Marsh, about the challenge of flow. Yeah. And we talk about this a lot. It's not yeah. like it's all new. But these are, that's a very good specific example you're giving of something yeah. that sounds like it will make a difference. So yeah. it would just be interesting to know what the cost and benefit of that is uh, yeah. for taxpayers and indeed for patients. But thank you. So Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Um, you've put a very good gloss between you on this uh, delayed discharges. And you've said that the system is getting better. But if I can take you to paragraph 1.12 on page 17 of the report, it makes it perfectly clear at the start of March 23 this, this year, these delayed discharges had increased to 49,331 longer than 21 days and 19,337 for those staying longer than, um, uh, uh, sorry, the first figure was seven days and the second figure uh, was 21 days. So actually the situation is getting worse compared to pre-pandemic rather than better, isn't it? Just to be clear, pre-pandemic we didn't measure this in the same way. So pre-pandemic it was a delayed discharge and that was where health and social care together agreed that a patient met a particular set of, set of criteria which meant that their discharge was delayed. Not meeting the criteria to reside, which is the figure that you're quoting, is something different. This is about a daily analysis of whether there is something that we could do to move that patient forward where they would get a, they, that could now be done outside of hospital. So I think, I don't know, uh, sorry, with permission, I don't know, uh, Professor Powers, if you want to say a bit more about not meeting the criteria to reside and why we changed from delayed discharge in the pandemic. It'd be helpful to know what the change means. Yeah. Well, well, we changed particularly uh, at the start of the pandemic because we wanted to move towards um, helping hospitals identify early the patients uh, who may, uh, who who, who were coming up for discharge. So we introduced a set of criteria, uh, some which physiological criteria to flag up 
uh, to teams that these are the people, these are the patients who are likely to be ready for discharge. I think that worked well in the pandemic. Uh, I think the point is that we we want to move to a different metric moving forward because it was a very pandemic specific uh, metric. It's got some advantages, but it's also got some disadvantages as well. So uh, that's the metric that that um, Mr. Style was talking about earlier. Um, it, 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 I'm very happy to talk about length of stay if you if you want well, to say a few words on well, length of stay. My constituents will be listening to that answer with great interest because for the last two years, and Gloucestershire MPs have been complaining about it, Gloucestershire has twice the average length of discharges compared to the rest of the country. And interestingly enough, the constituency data, if you add up all the days of uh, dis uh, 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 delayed discharges and divide them by the number of the trust, they come out almost exactly half what my trust is, 174 days. Do you think this has anything to do with the workforce plan saying that there are 165,000 posts vacant and that the work pro pressures in adult social care mean that meeting people's needs at home or in the community is challenging? Because that is what my constituencies, constituents <coughs> believe. It is a lack of social care workers being able to provide the packages of domiciliary care to enable those people to be discharged from hospital. Yes, there's no doubt that that is part of part of the challenge that we face. I think we've been very clear about that throughout, that there is a challenge in, in social care. Uh, as, as you have rightly said, the challenge isn't entirely in social care. There is uh, work to be done in the hospital sector. We need to be clear about that as well. Uh, but workforce issues in social and domiciliary care uh, are challenging, as you know, and Gloucestershire is one of the systems that we work closest yeah. with, actually, uh, on some of these system issues. But, but the problems that you've described in your constituency will be replicated uh, across the country. I hope not uh, double the average rate. May, maybe not, but but the but issues in social care and domiciliary care are yeah. are undoubtedly I'm playing. Glad we have a measure of agreement. At least we have a, an agreement on the problem. That's yes. always a start. Yeah. Um, how long is it going to take to fix so that my constituents will see a noticeable difference? Well, um, that might be one for department colleagues who uh, oversee social care but of course what we can focus on the NHS is working as closely as possible uh, through integrated care systems with social care colleagues. Uh, the long-term workforce plan is a, is a plan for the NHS. Uh, obviously some of those colleagues in the social care sector are nurses and so this will increase nurses in the round uh, but there are very specific challenges in the social care sector that um, I know our colleagues in the Department of Health Social Care are very well aware of and don't know whether yeah, I mean, um, uh, so um, no one's. Uh, I, I, I won't rehearse the challenges of social care because we have discussed them in this committee uh, uh, a lot. On your specific uh, question, uh, the government has, of course, made considerable, significant investments over the next two uh, uh, years on uh, uh, on the social care, which the Chancellor did in the uh, autumn statement. Uh, we're currently, although the, the official figures are out next week, and I won't uh, prejudge them, but all our reports uh, from both the NHS and local government uh, is that the workforce position has stabilised. We now need to see it improve, and we need to see those additional investments over the next two years uh, turn into noticeable differences for your constituents uh, and uh, others. As I said, um, and I don't think what I said was in, in any way contradictory to what you said, we, we, we saw delayed discharges peak in January and fall uh, from uh, there, which I think is consistent with the numbers uh, that you gave. We need to see them come down a lot more. I'm not saying that uh, the improvement is uh, where anyone would want it to be. It demonstrates that the investments that the government has already made can make a difference, and we therefore need to see the up to 2.8 billion we're investing uh, or the uh, spending power that local government has this year and then four point okay. uh, billion next year turn into the kind of changes that you Just make. clarify that answer. The, those figures reported by the NAO were to March 23, so I don't think uh, I, we, we were not able to see any reduction between January and, and March, as you said. No, Ose, but, um, but, but when you look at the underlying numbers, it peaked in January and has fallen since then, which is, is entirely consistent with what the NAO has written. We need to see it come down uh, further. And, we, and as you say, a component of that challenge is the uh, uh, local, uh, uh, local authority uh, sector care workforce, and we need to see that go up. Real icing on the cake. 
is that my constituents want to see a long-term plan for the social care workforce. When are we going to get that? So they can be reassured that they are going to get more social care workers to deal with this very difficult problem. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, uh, the government has not set out that it will do a long-term uh, plan in, in the same way as the NHS does. Uh, they are, of course, not our workforce. These are mainly private employees and uh, uh, of uh, uh, independent uh, companies. So we cannot plan it in the same sort of way that we do for the uh, uh, NHS. Uh, to, uh, we do take a number of measures on workforce that I've described to this committee before won't go through. Yep. Um, and as I say, the absolute key to it is the government has made some really quite significant investments in this area, which we need to trans see translated by local authorities into an improved service. But um, as, as I say, it's not, it, it's not a sector you can plan in the same way as the NHS for the reasons that you understand. G given that it has such a knock-on effect, on the health service, these delayed discharges, and I'm going to come on to ambulances in a second, yep. surely you ought to be liaising very carefully with your colleagues in the department for levelling up to make sure that we do have a long-term social care workforce. Um, well, I mean, I mean, actually what we do is we talk direct to local authorities and to uh, you know, employers, but to solve this problem um, and this challenge, it will be thousands of individual employment decisions by independent people not um, in the way uh, in in the way that we can plan a whole system uh, like we do the uh, uh, like we can do with the uh, NHS so it's not an area where I could say if there was a nice government plan somehow if we think would didn't be all right it comes down to a sector working properly and the interaction of the public sector and the private sector we do, there are, if, sorry, if I may, uh, uh, Sir Geoffrey, um, there are steps we have we, are, we have been taking. So uh, over 22, um, uh, 23, we ran a national recruitment campaign. We've made changes to the shortage occupation list. Uh, we have put uh, dedicated funding to support local areas to improve recruitment practices. We're working proactively with Job Centre Plus to promote social care careers to job seekers. Uh, we provide toolkits to help employers uh, to retain a Develop their own staff so that you know where appropriate there is national action from the government to support the social care workers. Can I just check workforce. on the shortage occupation list? If someone's given a visa to come as a social care worker, what are the requirements? Do they have to be very senior. How long are they allowed to stay? Um, I would have to get back to you on the on the on the specific details, but we have we have made some changes which have made it significantly easier for employers uh, in the social care sector to to operate in the international recruitment market. Thank you. So let's see if we can get another measure of agreement, uh, Professor Powis, and that's the knock-on effect of delayed discharges on ambulance trusts. So if I could take you to paragraphs, uh, paragraph 3.12 on page 39, and it says there, at the mean Category 1 incident response time for London was 6 minutes 51, whereas in the South West Ambulance Service it's a staggering 10 minutes 20 seconds. Uh, worse still, Category 2... Uh, the best ambulance service was 26 minutes, 20 seconds. Um, in South West, it's one hour, one minute and 57 seconds. I mean, those are pretty shocking response times, and I imagine that the delayed discharge must play some part in that, although I do accept that the South West Ambulance Service is a very large rural area, but they should be able to provide different ambulance stations to deal with that situation. So what is the answer to these differences between the very best response times in ambulance trusts and the worst one, such as South West? Yeah, well, well, as you have rightly said, um, this has to be seen in the context of the entire flow through hospitals. And as I've said earlier, that if you have delays on discharge, that will feed its way through to difficulties uh, uh, transferring patients from ambulances into emergency departments and releasing ambulances back to address, uh, to uh, go and see the next uh, call. Um, the, the response times were uh, not where, not at all where they needed to be over the winter. We've acknowledged that. They have subsequently uh, improved significantly, both in Category 1 and cate Category 2. And I think that is, uh, that is because those um, acute flow issues that we saw over the winter have improved for a variety of reasons, not least that we've come out of winter, but also some, of the, work, some of the measures that we've been putting in place and some of the improvement work. How, how we do, much we is do, because we've come out of winter and how much is down to other well, well, undoubtedly, winter is always a time when we get a lot of infectious diseases so we we have as we acknowledged right at the start of the committee and i think you acknowledged um 
this winter was a very, very difficult winter. We had COVID and flu for the first time occurring, peaking together, a particularly bad flu season. Uh, we had Group A streptococcus in, um, in, in December. So a whole lot of things, particularly about last winter. Very happy to talk about next winter a little bit later on. Um, so, so undoubtedly some of the improvements are coming out winter, but also we have put in a series of measures. We've talked about discharges. We've also been working with hospitals around the, am the ambulance handover uh, part of this. Uh, sometimes that is around staffing models. Sometimes it's around putting in temporary accommodation to ensure that ambulances can release patients to emergency departments quickly. Uh, but we've al also been working with ambulance services. We've made some adjustments to uh, the Category 2 call response uh, mechanism, how that works. So there's been a whole host of things things that have been going on. Okay. But you are right, there is variation, and, and you are absolutely right that the South West uh, and, and some of our uh, ambulance services that cover large rural areas, so the East of England would be another, have particular challenges, and they, they in a sense, get disproportionately affected by some of those flow issues uh, that we've been talking about. Okay, that's helpful. So, but, uh, um, Ms Marsh, mm -hmm. take it to page 34 on paragraph 3.9. There is absolutely no excuse for uh, whether it's a rural uh, ambulance trust or not. And what that paragraph tells us, that in relation to 999 calls, the best ambulance trust response time to calls was 5.4 seconds compared to 67.4 seconds in the South West Ambulance Trust. It begins to build up a pattern, doesn't it? And that's so, a, yeah, so this is one of the areas that we're working on as part of the improvement plan for ambulance services. So there's absolutely things, as we've all described, that need to happen at the interface with hospitals. But there are lots of things that we know happen in better in some ambulance services than others. So some is the way that they staff and work their um, call answering centres, which you're referring to here, the amount of hear and treat they do. So there's quite a bit of variation in those that will treat a patient over the phone as opposed to go and see them and then see and treat and take to hospital. So what, what our work at the moment is to really get those that are doing best to help and support those that are in difficulty. And actually, to go back to uh, Sir Chris, is description of the tiering system that we've got. The South West Ambulance Service are in our tier one, so we are giving them extra help and support this year, both financially and uh, sort of with improvement uh, to, to help them to get and improve. And we're starting to see some improvements there. The big thing we're doing on top just to help ambulance services as well is investing in them directly so that they've got a greater percentage of ambulance hours on the road, so over 7% more deployed hours on the road uh, for ambulances, which will help. And there were some disparities and South West was one of the areas that got a disproportionate amount of the investment that we made in NHS England to try and get it to or support it to be able to... to Hopefully to that, 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 that's good news about the support you're giving. Let's hope that that flows through in some of the results. Final question from me. Again, in the variation between the best and the worst trust, in terms of workforce, yeah. um, we have a, one of the highest levels of vacancies as a proportion of our NHS staff. We have one of the highest, lowest levels of morale in our staff. What can be done with a trust like mine that has, has some of these worst metrics compared to the best? How can you bring the worst up to the best? I think there's lots of uh, there's lots of things that people have done to try in particular to think about how teamwork and the way that sort of the individual teams within a service can really help and support people to feel valued, like their ideas are listened to, that they can influence the work. And in those places that have really focused on those team-based models, we've seen sickness levels go down and we've seen sort of a morale improve and uh, turnover reduce. So again, this is about trying to learn from places that are doing some of this, these things really well. I think the other part is, uh, and it goes back to what uh, Ms Pritchard was saying earlier, about if people are asked to do a lot of overtime to <coughs> cover gaps in rotor shifts, people can be, you know, they're doing it for the right reasons, but they can become too tired quite quickly and so on so as we invest in additional paramedic and paramedic sort of technicians that's also really massively helping as well because that helps to there to be a larger quantum of workforce Sorry. overall yeah there's a final question for me this is a problem that feeds on itself doesn't of course it? if you've it does, got more yeah. vacancies yeah. you're going to ask your staff to do more overtime they become more demoralized yeah. so what can we do about that that's why we've made the, we've 
with the majority of the resource that's been available, so we've put an extra £200 million of our NHS uh, funding into ambulance services, is exactly to address this problem of being well, able to have sustainable here, rentals. I'm talking about the NHS Trust here, the main well, trust. The same for the NHS Trust as well. That it, as we're able to make sure that we've got the right amount of beds, for example, in each of the individual uh, trusts or overall systems, that helps the, the to be the substantive staffing in, in place. That really helps and supports everybody to feel uh, to feel valued and more likely to stay. I think the issue is when people can see, you know, again, if they're asked to work in areas that they're unfamiliar with, or if there's beds in places that we call escalation areas, then people just, you know, they don't have as much as an association as if they're there working in a in sort of their regular ward so again we've put disproportionate investment into the southwest to try and get both the trust themselves and the ambulance service to really have the capacity in place that they need a ahead of winter and just repeat, to complete we repeat, did this is not ambulance trust this is the main nhs trust i'm talking about in terms of morale and vacancies yes but with the two things sort of absolutely going hand in hand and just to complete um, we did some brilliant work in uh through the ICB and the Trust, we actually, during the course of January and March, board, just to managed to get lots of the long-stay patients out and we had nobody waiting, uh, uh, nobody in hospital over 50 days for the first time in, in the Trust in the course of that period. So there's an awful lot of work going on to really sort of focus the energy and attention on those systems that we know need the most help. If, I'm, if I may... Very uh, briefly, Mr Sarland. Just, just making the link between your question and the earlier discussion on the long-term workforce plan, we do know uh, that where we train people has a very big impact uh, on where people choose to stand practice, and we've said explicitly that in expanding training places we'll have regard to that. Thank you. We'll come, we'll come back uh, to that. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms Marsh, mm -hmm. um, I just want to uh, go a little bit deeper on congestion in hospitals and good process management and what other measures can be taken to help hospitals out. How good are ambulance services across the country at supporting patients, people in their homes so they don't have to go to hospital? So dealing with people on the spot mm -hmm. and not having them go to hospital or to A&E and they can receive another form of care. Are, are ambulance services good at helping with that across the country, and who's good? Absolutely. Uh, so this is a big area of focus in the UEC recovery plan, because if we can stop people going to hospital in the first place that don't need to be there, then that's better for everybody, isn't it? So uh, it works really well when the ambulance services are working alongside community services, so those people who understand how to make the best response to support that individual. And we've got lots of examples across the country in all ambulance services, uh, in, including some of the ones that we've talked about that, that have to struggle with response times overall that are really good at this about getting alongside people it could be people who've fallen it could be people that are known to community services they can call on what we call our two-hour community response you teams say all ambulance services were good at it all ambulance services have got some work a, a, a working partnership in their local systems to be able to do this but we do have variation in the way that people do that and one of the things that we we're working on is trying to make sure that all people that could get a better response at home or in their nursing home or in residential care yeah, yeah. get that response there and they don't get conveyed to hospital unnecessarily to sit outside when actually they could have been looked yeah. after in their well, own it's brilliant stuff in and if you can home. help people at home that's fantastic but you did talk about having a understanding and a variation yes so um who's the best outlier which ambulance service is great at helping people, keeping people at home, uh, and, and what's the difference between the uh, worst performer compared to the best don't think there's one answer because so there's lots of, there's lots of different models that people deploy. So they could, uh, so so some of it is about the looking after people in their own home. Some of it actually the ambulance service it works really well when the community service provider themselves sits as part of the ambulance service so for example they do this in the east of england ambulance service and when the call comes into the control center instead of the ambulance going in the first place they can deploy the community response so it's not just about the ambulance going and doing it is in there a national home. metric of this or how do you understand the overall uk or sorry england figure for best performing ambulance services at helping keeping people in their home 
Uh, we don't have a metric for the best performing of ambulance services in their own home. We have a series of metrics that we look at about whether what we call a category two a category three ambulance, sorry, so that's an ambulance where we could have had an alternative response about whether or not um, ambulance services routinely take those patients to hospital or whether they've got either can provide services themselves or whether they've got good links with community services, which means that they don't need to go to the go to the patient and dip, and take them to hospital in the first place. Do you know place. who's good at it? Uh, we collect some data on the uh, on the um, community response times and the uh, the amount of patients that are getting a service an alternative service that are not being deployed to hospital when they're a category three or a category four ambulance but we don't have a performance measure or a performance standard where we say we expect people to hit this you know this particular target or that target so that we can start to to doing but we spend a lot of time particularly with ambulance services just sharing that practice and some of these are new models these are things that people started in the pandemic they're starting to show improvement now and it's about how we sort of share and learn and get people to grow. Is it, I might just be, if I may chair just to say so we do measure things like hear and treat, see yeah. and treat as two metrics. We also measure things like urgent community response. So that's both volume of patients and speed of response. We measure things like virtual wards. So it's a different kind of model that's more about again the step up model so that you uh, have community teams looking after people at their own home to avoid them going in. So actually I think that's what you're describing is there's a range of different things that we measure. What we don't do is bring them together into a single metric at the moment. It'd be worthwhile to bring them together. I think, I think the challenge is exactly the one that Sarah Jane's describing, which is that these, there are some quite different stages of development across the country and different models have been established. So just to make sure that we had the right currency and we were measuring apples and apples rather than apples and pears, it's probably a bit challenging. But why don't we take that away? Because it's a good we'll question. We'll pilot it in an area. In yeah. Across okay, thank, you. thank you. Chair. Okay, thank you. Mr Mark Francois, MP. Thank you, Dame Meg. Uh, Ms Mars, just to prove that we're not only here to pick holes or endlessly talk mm -hmm. about money, you mentioned the East of England Ambulance Trust. Um, they have been under great pressure like all the others, but I can vouch for the fact. I've been to their control centre. Mm -hmm. They're doing a lot better now. They're, they're very well led by a man called Tom Abel, who you, you yes. may have come across. We know Tom very well, yes. <laughs> and, and not to say there aren't still lots of challenges, but they really seem to be doing everything they practically can. So while we've got an opportunity to acknowledge that in public, I think I think we should do. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Ms Pritchard, could I just ask you, what, what was the rate of staff outflow from the NHS in the year just gone, so in 2022-23, what percentage of your staff left the National Health Service? You're talking about so the turnover, staff turnover. Yes. Um, I haven't got the exact figure to hand, I'm afraid, but it's about 9%. About 9%. That's quite worrying. So coming on for one in 10, the, 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 the Ministry of Defence, by contrast, they're under a great deal of pressure. Um, in the last year just ended, financial year, their outflow was about 6%, so that you're one and a half times higher than the, than the armed forces. And the NOD have a system whereby they survey all armed forces personnel. It's a voluntary survey, and they, they can reply confidentially. They call it the Armed Forces Continuous Attitude Survey, and AFCAS. You know from our previous discussions, I'm not, not a great one for bureaucracy, but I can see the, the value of asking people what they think about the organisation they work for. Does the NHS have any pan-NHS system like AFCAS? So we have a common, well, we have a range of different things. We have the staff survey, which is an annual survey, which gives a feedback at individual organisational levels. So, so that's I think at trust level, is it? That's trust level, so in fact that's what um, Sir Geoffrey was referring to earlier in relation yeah. to his own local trust. Um, but we also have other um, surveys which... Uh, specifically pick up things that are the drivers for why people leave so hidden in that figure of course some people go on to be promoted go to other trusts you know there's, there's, yes. there's movement in there it's not just it's not necessarily that people are leaving the NHS they might be going to other roles within the NHS but what we do know from that is some of the things that we were talking about before about the retention part of the long-term workforce plan is the things that really matter to people so Sarah Jane mentioned some earlier really matters to people that they've got flexibility 
it really matters to them that that flexibility works for patients as well as it works for them as individuals. It really matters that people have got a sense of continuous career development so that they've got a sense of investment in their own personal futures. And actually leadership, um, particularly clinical leadership, so it's the team leadership, it's the ward you work mm-hmm. on, it's the clinical team you work on. Also, you know, it really matters. Okay, now you haven't mentioned pay there. Now, yes, pay now, also matters, yes, yeah, I, I should have said that. But, and, and I think it's fair to say that it does, but it's often also not the only thing. You know, it's one of a, when people leave an organisation, and again I go back to my MOD experience, often they leave for a combination of reasons. And sometimes there's one thing which is, if you like, in normal parlance, the straw that breaks the camel's back. But it's usually a kind of decision in the round. And if you look at hospitals now, you know, we all, as politicians, we talk all the time about doctors and nurses, where we're used to doing that. But, you know, there are lots of other people in the hospital, yeah. lots of clinicians, physios to radiographers. You've got cleaners, you've got porters. And without all of those different bits of the orchestra, you can't play the concert. So, again, I think it's worth, it's worth putting that on the record, too. But when you, because the NHS is so large, we've all got lots of friends who work in it. And when I've spoken to some people who've left in the last year or so, now admittedly this is anecdotal, but often the reason that they say they leave is because they've just lost their sense of job satisfaction. They're not enjoying going to work in the way that they did. And they give a variety of reasons for that, and one of those is bureaucracy. One person said they left the NHS to become an accountant, I'll mention to the NAO. when I asked the person why, she said, because I was having to fight every day just to do the job that I signed up to do. Why has the NHS become so incredibly bureaucratic? So I think without knowing a bit more about the detail of your friend's personal circumstance or colleague's personal no. circumstance, it could be slightly difficult to give a, a I think I think, I think Mr. 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 France but was not asking for a, a contact. I think, I think he was using that to illustrate the wider sure. point about but dissatisfaction. But well, let, 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 things people really, we know that there is a, a real... Um, frustration sometimes with the burden of, of reporting so mm. I mean we've talked about it today metrics what do we collect data on can we tell which is the best performing worst performing well someone has to enter that information <laughs> somewhere and that well, is the well, let me try and give you a more specific example that the hospital that person worked at between the senior clinical level say uh, not mm. doctors but senior clinic, say sort of band seven band eight and Miss Marsh you can help us here there are about seven layers of management some of whom have a clinical role, but most of whom don't, between those clinicians and the trust chief executive. Why does it require so many layers of management to run a district general hospital in the 21st century? So, I mean, no, no, no I, was, I was asking Miss Marsh. She, she's Ms. Marsh, most recently, yeah, you've been most recently she, she, in No disrespect, but she's a bit closer to the coalface. Well, I, well, I, well, I know, Miss Pritchard was. Trust chief executive well, myself, myself, for Ms. Marsh quite a long time. Yeah, I mean, I was a trust chief executive, executive until uh, I left my trust at Christmas 13 and a half years, and I wouldn't recognise no. there being that many layers. That feels very unusual. I mean, you do need to collect things into into leadership groups because people want to be able to make change together, and that's really important. But I would have thought that was quite a lot of layering over and above that which I would ima- that which I would know to be typical. Was it like at St Thomas's? Well, so we had a clinical leadership model, that's right, so each directorate was led by a clinical director, mm-hmm. sometimes that was mostly it was a doctor, not always, sometimes it was an AHP or a nurse or a midwife um, and they worked with a team of again predominantly clinical colleagues to run units of uh, uh, that made sense, might be ward level, might be service level um, and mostly that is to develop the, you know, response to you know, local problem solving, local patients that allows people to feel really uh, real ownership of their roles and really thrive well, in them. I accept you can, get into, that, you can get into a debate about I think that. it's it, just to really acknowledge there is variation across the NHS, we absolutely acknowledge that and obviously each local organisation determines for itself how well, it's going to be structured. We're, talking about, we're ultimately talking about productivity for the sake of the patients who use the service. and. Uh, you can get to a debate about when is a manager not a manager. I, I, I understand that. But, you know, most big organisations, if they're looking to become more productive and more efficient, go through a process of delayering. They take out levels of management. They make lines of accountability clearer and sharper. The NHS seems to be going in completely the, the opposite direction. Right at the top of a massively top-heavy system, you've got large numbers of 
policy officials at NHS England in Leeds and very large numbers of policy officials in DHSC headquarters in Victoria Street. And often the two don't necessarily always agree on everything. That's one of the reasons why the NHS workforce plan took years to come to fruition in the first place, isn't it? Don't you realise you're losing a lot of really good people at the, at the coalface because they're part of such a massively top-heavy organisation and a lot of them have had enough of it? Um, no, I don't think I do agree with that, though um, uh, I of course agree that... Um, then why are you losing efficient... one in ten of your people well, every year? No, I'm, I'm, I'm disagreeing with um, at, uh, the, um, uh, your characterisation of the, uh, uh, the centre. Uh, on most of the international uh, uh, benchmarks, uh, we have one of the lowest percentage of spend on um, uh, management as opposed to... Uh, 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 clinical is one of the things uh, King's Fund was pointing this out, uh, where we benchmark as uh, efficient. That is different from your previous point about layers of management within an organisation, uh, whereas Sarah Jane was saying what you were describing didn't sound uh, like uh, uh, best practice, but I wouldn't associate that with um, how NHS England and DHSC reacts. If I can find you a hospital other. with seven layers of management, between Band 8 and the CEO, you look into it, right? Great, good. Well, okay, no, no, that, that'll do. Um, <laughs> now, you make some quite heroic assumptions in your plan about retention. A and it's the same for the military. There's no point widening the aperture of the recruitment tap if you can't put a retention plug in the sink because otherwise you're constantly running to stand still, aren't you? And even the most mustard keen new recruit can't make up for the experience of when a 15 or 20 year person walks out the door. It's going to take you years to train them. That, that's, just, that's just the nature of the, of the beast, isn't it, really? So, so if you wanted to improve that, one practical example, you've got this state-of-the-art bed management system in four trusts. Mm -hmm. And you said by this year you're going to roll it out into 16 other trusts. Because it's so fundamental to the efficient working of a hospital, why haven't you got a crash program to get that into every single trust this year? It's, it's quite a challenging... It, 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 it's something that requires... It's not just the technology itself, it's the deployment, so it's having the expertise to get absolute value out of it so that you, you don't just put a plug in a system and then carry on working how you were working. You're working in a very different way, so we think that's the right number to focus on this year, and then we'll get the learning from that and my ambition would be to then... Well, for, forgive me if, 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 I, if I push back. We all know from our constituency experiences that this issue of you know, patient flow and, mm. and, and having enough beds in a hospital is fundamental. It affects the ambulance trusts, as Mr. Uh, Sir Geoffrey was saying. It affects so many other things. Mm. So I, I'm still not convinced by your answer. If you found a state-of-the-art system for doing this better in some hospitals, far better from what you were saying than in others, surely logic suggests you should roll that out across the entire NHS as fast as possible, <coughs> and then fewer people would be inclined to leave, wouldn't they? So 16 is the priority for this year. Can I just go back to what I said before about we're not going, it's not... Uh, How many <laughs> district general hospitals are there in England? Uh, Roughly. There are 150 with type okay, 1. So, so if, you no, roll, if you rolled them out, if you extrapolated that, it would, yeah. take, you, it would take you nearly 10 years, 9, 10 years. To okay, perhaps Ms. Marshall might be able to explain the trajectory. Yeah, as, you, as so how quickly... Well. This is about... Because it, it, the only, it, at the moment, it's only in a handful of places, and they're places that have prioritised it and done it themselves, and they've got often quite unique leadership that have, that have had a vision and it's been their thing to do. This, six, this group of 16, we're doing this in more in organisations that have got a whole range of challenges, and they're going to be doing lots of other things as well, putting in extra beds, uh, you know, the, the, lots of other at the same time. So we want to help and support these 16 places that are the most fragile to do this really well and to make sure that we give them not just the financial resources but also the expertise to, to be able to support support them. We'll then quickly learn the lessons of that and move on to the next stage of the programme. But every system will be doing more work on the data that they're looking at, what we call the, we talked about the hospital sort of uh, uh, bed management, but we've also got the system, what we call the system coordination centres, because yes. it's really important that we can not just see the beds in the hospital, but we can see community services, we can see services in social care and so on. So I wouldn't want you to be left with the impression well, I'm, this I'm is sorry, only about can't, the 16 you, you can't, you, In a sense, you can't have it both ways. 
you were making a really big thing 45 minutes ago about how brilliant this new system is. So not unreasonably, we say, well, just roll it out across all the hospitals, and then you give me a whole range of reasons why you can't. I think anyone watching this programme who isn't an expert or someone high not up quite in the chair, Mr. Francois, the star of your reality TV, I know, but it's so fundamental to the challenges that face the NHS. I'm not saying it's the silver bullet for everything, but you were telling us 45 minutes it was a bit of a game changer. Surely you can speed that up, right? What's the trajectory? If you've yeah, got 16 trajectory? this year, I get you're piloting it, you're trying to get different trusts on board. So is there a plan to roll out? So I, 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 might I jump in? Because I think that um, Ms Marsh might be being slightly coy about this, partly because I think the Secretary of State would absolutely share the ambition to want to roll out this system and indeed many other things that sit in that digital tech space that we know can make a difference, some of it incrementally, some of it more dramatically. Uh, but it is one of the reasons why in the workforce plan we have said, and again supported by government, that continued and sustained investment in NHS infrastructure but also a significant increase increase in funding for technology and innovation are going to be critical because if we do want to continue to get productivity benefits and there's no doubt this system mm -hmm. is one of the ways which we absolutely can do that but not on its own we need to do all the other things that we've described in the urgent emergency care plan as well then we do need to see a continued investment so that's one of the things that we'll need to pick up uh, with colleagues as part my of last budget setting my last next couple. year. It's great that you're trying to recruit more people into the National Health Service. But if you, if you can't stop experienced people leaving all the time, you're running to stand still. So what are the key ways you're going to persuade very experienced staff, be they doctors, nurses, clinicians or other ranks in the NHS, not to leave an organisation which at the moment has a 10% vacancy rate and has a rate of people leaving of 9% a year? So I think we've, I mean, we've covered some of this already. There are things that are outside our control, so pay is one of them. Workload is another issue, and we know that that really matters. So if you don't feel you can do your best work, that really affects people's desire to continue to work in the NHS. Therefore, all the things that we're describing today, all of those things are hugely important in retention as well as they are in making sure that we're doing the absolute best we can for our patients. But in terms of the specific offers that we'll be making as part of the long-term workforce plan, there are a range of measures particularly focused on flexibility and I've talked about career end but it's you know from day one flexibility that works for patients flexibility that works for our staff as well as continuous career development and that is uh, that that package of things we know works because in the 23 trusts that are already piloting that range of things and have been over the course of this year the rate of improvement that they have seen in retention has been twice that for the rest Certainly of the Certainly I think career development is very important. We want you to succeed. I just think some of your assumptions in the workforce plan about retention are bordering on the heroic but let's hope you can be heroes. <laughs> can, 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 I, can I just add? Because I, I mean, I do think. Yeah, I mean, you put your finger on a lot of the key, uh, uh, the very key elements here. Well, well thank but, you for that. Yeah, obviously, the uh, the uh, uh, the pension changes that the government has made are a very significant uh, uh, intervention, and that is quoted by uh, certainly a lot of senior doctors as being one component. Uh, Clearly, the in-hospital management questions and have you created the kind of environment you're talking about is key. The other one a lot of people say, um, which well, was mentioned earlier, but it's very key, is the hope for the future bit. Yes. So it one is. of the points of having the workforce plan in the first place is actually if you stay you're not going to be working in an organization with very high vacancy rates where you're asked to do lots of overtime and mm. difficult shifts as it were and i think it's those three components working together um, there's definitely the money aspect but as i say a lot of that locked up in the pension definitely the how is the organization managed and does it want, make me want to get out of bed in the morning and can i see hope for the future uh, right, la lastly and that's, I'm, I'm, must give it during COVID, very many people with medical experience, as it were, reported to the colours. Yep. You know, and, and, and that was an amazing act of collective generosity and even bravery to do that, to bolster the NHS in a time yep. of need. Do you have, but a lot of those people have now gone because they, as it were, responded to the emergency. Do you have any proposals in the workforce plan to try and get people who've left the service to come back as opposed to just trying yes, to keep and, um, I'll, the Yes, and I'll ask my NHS colleagues to add, but a lot of that is in things that um, Amanda was talking about, about flexibility. Yeah. Uh, so, um, um, I, mean, I mean, this is true across 
uh, of course the entire economy, but certainly the public services, the sort of very sharp break between you're either a full-time employee mm. um, or you're retired is clearly not the way the world is going to work. Mm. Now, um, where I think you're completely right is our systems, including you know, the very basics of how pensions work and you know, do you sacrifice pension by going part-time, whatever. So what we need is for people who are in the category of uh, that you're talking about of, I'd quite like to do more for the NHS, but I don't want to be on call at 2 a.m. or I don't want a full-time job. Uh, we need to be developing the roles, um, and there are a lot of new roles, and you know, things like doing 111 and those sorts of things. And then we need, as I say, those really practical things of how does your pension work and do you get penalised if you do that? Yeah. Um, so that people can. But it's all in that well, flexibility. I can, I can give you some. We're waking up the panel here on this so, issue. Yeah, well, well, you are. Well, it's, I mean, it's a really no, good question. They're fighting and, to get in. It's normally the other way around. No, well, I mean, we're, we're, these we're are one of the most important questions is can we get a yes, structure we'll go, we're, of the workforce? Well, certainly, it's obviously but a passion. from the medical workforce, if you're a... Consultant, say, same argument with GPs, and you're coming up to your 50s, etc. Um, and you're looking at your later career stages. So the pensions issue definitely been an issue. So that's resolved. That will encourage a more flexible, um, you know, work-life mm. balance. So uh, this is where a conversation, which we've already started um, uh, to systematise with with consultants uh, at, at that age, around: Do you want to stay on call? Uh, do you want to move to do more educational work, more educational training, all the sorts of stuff that we talked about in the long-term workforce plan? That's the sort of thing that will encourage people to stay. It does, of course, require having sufficient workforce to allow people to have that flexibility, which is why the numbers are really important at the heart of this. Um, and, and then, and then, as you've said, making it easier for people to come back, so not to worry about pensions when you come back, mm. uh, but also to come back into a, a range of flexible portfolio careers such as 111. So, so I think that that is what will attract uh, people as they go through their career uh, to want to stay, or if they do want to leave, not to leave completely. Yeah. Uh, because this is, we don't necessarily need you full time. Uh, we'd rather have you part time than not at all. And, Consultants and, and are and fundamentally important. Yeah. But the, these but principles will apply to the whole exactly. system. Right? So if you are a ward sister and you arrive on a Monday morning and your ward is not fully staffed, the staff that you have are agency staff yeah. who you have not worked with before and you are a little bit unsure of, uh, then that is not an environment that, that sends your morale sky high. If you arrive on a Monday morning to a ward that is fully staffed with people that you have worked with, many of whom that you have trained, then that, that is the start of a good week. And that is what the long-term plan is designed to deliver because it's that sort of satisfaction at work that ultimately will lead me people to make the choice that I want to come to work and I want to continue working to the NHS rather than, uh, rather than think about leaving. I think you put it very well, sir. Dame Meg. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Bedley, MP. Thank you, uh, dear Meg. And I know we're pressed for time, so if I, if I can ask for brevity in some of the answers, I'd be very grateful. Um, the discussion this afternoon has kind of outlined a number of... Uh, other dependencies on which the success of the plan uh, rests. Um, and you've just mentioned, uh, Ms. Pritchard, about the investment in technology and innovation and infrastructure. Indeed, the plan says that uh, for it to succeed, it will require a significant increase in funding. Very, very simply, how much is significant? Well, so the plan, which again has got kind of support from uh, government and in fact from widely welcomed, which is great across the party, um, talks about continued uh, investment, continued and sustained investment. And I think that's the, that's the important thing. It's the ability uh, to think, particularly when we're thinking about technology and particularly when we're thinking about digitisation, to think about this not as a, just a one-year thing, but as a multi-year uh, set of changes. And we've explored some of the very practical benefits already. And are we talking here about an increase in funding over a, over a period of time? Well, so we've in the plan, that's what we've talked about, continued and sustained, but also particularly in the area of tech, we would yeah. want to see that as a, as a gradually increase, well, certainly as, a, a, as an overall increase as well. And forgive me now, does, is that investment something that is in addition to the 2.4 billion over the five years? So that's, that's part of what uh, Sir Chris was talking about earlier when we were talking about the um, overall settlement for the NHS funding. So there is already funding set aside for capital investment, which is not included in the 2.4, which is partly the new hospitals programme, which we'll be looking at. But I think we're, we're, we're dancing around this a lot. There's £2.4 billion for five years. You're all putting up a heroic 
uh, argument how brilliant that is, and that's great. Yeah. But there's still this question, as Mr. Francois hit on right at the beginning, that what's what about the next 10 years? So I think you've all put in your pitch that on a cross-party basis you want this to be supported, so we hear that. <laughs> uh, we'll all go back to our, our constituencies preparing for government and make that message clear to our manifesto writers, I guess. But uh, and I'll shut it Can I make one other point about the five Powell. years versus ten years, mm-hmm. which is the commitment. It might, might be a little bit in the small print, but the commitment and an ask of Treasury to refresh the plan every two years. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, because 15 years is an awful long time, <laughs> and, and technology will advance at, um, at inc- increasing pace over that 15 years. So, so actually describing the workforce in 15 years uh, with any degree of precision is quite challenging which is one why there are a range of numbers in here but actually what what we might want the workforce to be doing over the next five years in 10 years time in 2033 might be a bit different from our view in 2023 so that two-year refresh is going to be really important not just in establishing the funding requirements but actually in making sure that we design a workforce that is the right workforce because we could easily be designing something for 15 years time at this stage which isn't exactly what we need just look at artificial intelligence and imaging uh, and uh, that will be transformed by the time we get to 15 years time. That's the positive side on the other negative side when you saw a dip in nursing training uh, the nursing bursary and then the different training Mm. spaces we've seen that bulge come through so So there's the positive you want, you want to be optimistic, but there's a negative side of what governments might have to do or choose to do in the future. But anyway, we, we could get into the plan again, but I think we, we will not have covered it off. I think that's a really subject of much debate. I'm just going to briefly bring in uh, Mr Nick Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms Marsh, I've just been pondering one of your earlier answers, and I wonder if you could help me, please. Uh, you said on delayed discharge that hospitals own 20% of the problem, and that says that 80% of the problem relies somewhere else or lays somewhere else. Could you just let us know in terms of either other bits of the NHS or councils? Who, where are the chunky bits of responsibility for that 80% please? Yeah, so we, we look at it in four chunks. So we look at the percentage or we look at the, the broadly the group of patients that are going, they're going to go home and if the hospital can do everything they possibly can to get a smooth journey that will reduce that figure down then we've got groups of patients that need a quite complex help um sorry and and whose responsibility would that be do you think if it's not the hospital where does that for that set of people where does so in the first group it's it's predominantly the hospital leadership responsibility to have the best processes in the hospital to help and support people to leave in a timely way when they're that's the 20 percent you talked about and that's broadly uh 20 percent of the numbers that's just the when when you're quoting the number many understand the 80 percent. no no that's fine many of those people may only wait a a small small amount of time half a day a day that's still too many but they don't tend to have the sort of very long lengths of stay to go back to professor powers's point an example of a patient that would trigger that though is somebody that steps down in intensive care they from intensive care goes to the ward it would trigger the not meeting oh, they're not necessarily can, delayed we, at this just point just to say we understand that it's di- more common. The, okay. diffi- the difficulties that individuals will have and the complexity of the health so, service so that's it's, but you do a great job we're just trying to understand the accountability for that 80 percent because it's such a big number yeah, so in the remaining group, there are uh, people that need to leave hospital with a short-term package of care, which is health and social care in partnership. Uh, it's normally domiciliary care at home, but also with some input from NHS community services. And that is the next largest group of people that... That's a shared responsibility between NHS and who? That, between NHS and local government. Uh, that's a shared responsibility and About how big is that it chunk? works best when that group when when then you know people have got models where that's the pressure, same. I'm just trying to understand the 80 percent so the shared responsibility between uh, NHS and council what chunk of that 80 percent is that please that's normally somewhere between about 25 and 30 percent of people need need a shared uh a shared solution then there's a group of patients well that 50 percent there's a group of patients i mean it, it changed it well, yeah, 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 back the envelope here then there's another group of patients that just need to go into nhs community style beds we call that the pathway to that's probably about another 25 percent or so of another patients. bit of the nhs that's another part of the nhs uh so yeah usually communities in, in patient settings but and what we, percentage would that be 
we also need to think about uh, for, for the pressure. Uh, I'm just trying to understand what I think if we want to be 100 percent accurate, I think I'd yeah, yeah, send yeah, you those. Yeah. But I'm just giving yeah. you the yeah. The, no, no, we get we're getting the general. The broad, case, that's fine. Uh, and then there's another group of patients which are small in number, so they they but they can sometimes wait the longest amounts of time so these are people that are waiting to go into nursing or residential care so they'll show us only a smaller percentage but sometimes can wait four or five weeks from when they're ready to to go so so they're the broad chunks i think the the main thing is that the this is about the way we do this together across health and social care so although we and it's how we use our integrated care boards and we use what we call the better care fund which is a way of health and social care being able to pool resource together to come up with shared solutions because there are very different percentages in different parts of the country and very different solutions that are needed so so yeah it's a, it's a complex picture but it re- in the main it requires health and social care to work together okay we've got a bit better understanding that now. Okay. thank you thank you very much uh, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to look at some of the uh, factors driving trends in access and starting with 111 calls. Uh, Ms. Marsh, I heard before uh, what you said on ambulances. Um, however, looking at the NAO report, paragraph 3.4, uh, the number of calls answered within 60 seconds stayed relatively constant at between 11.2 million and 13.3 million despite increasing call volumes. That was up to 21 until falling to 8.4 million in 21-22 and then 8.1 million in 22-23. Uh, the uh, percentage of answered calls also fell very dramatically and positive satisfaction rates with NHS 111 have gone down by about 10% recently. Um, w- what's going wrong here? Why, why did both the number and proportion of 111 one calls answered within 60 seconds uh, declined so rapidly in 21 and 22. So we've seen a massive increase in demand for our 111 services uh, over the course of the last few years and it's not just the overall demand, it's not just the total number of people that are trying to use the service, it's the people that are trying to use it at particular points in the day uh, or at weekends. And we've had, just like other parts of the uh, of the NHS, we've had some recruitment and retention challenges for people working in 111 call centres. Uh, and so there are times when we're not able to, you know, have all the staff in place that we need for the total volumes of calls coming through. So I think 111 has been, yeah, just like other parts of the health service, really under increasing pressure. What we've been working uh, over the course of the last year or so and we're going to do more in preparation for this winter is having as much clinical advice and support so that our call handlers of the, that are answering the phone have got that ability to be able to draw on the clinical help and support and advice and get people call backs if they're not able to sort of answer their query um, uh, in the here and now but it's what we, we recognize the challenge and we recognize the need that if people ring 111 and they don't necessarily get an answer in a timely way they may go to other parts of the health service so it is a priority to get that uh, to get that number of calls answered in a timely way increased and then that clinical advice and support to help people are, are you actually saying that the the problem you've got with call handlers because you've got a huge increase in the number of people working in ambulances but are you saying that the call handlers are not keeping up with that? or, or? So The call handlers for 111 don't, are not necessarily part of the ambulance service. In some places, it's uh, 111 services are delivered by or in conjunction with ambulance providers. But in others, there's a different range of 111 providers. So, and we do see recruitment and retention challenges so it's another area where we've been trying to learn from like what what works why is it that people will stay in some uh, 111 services for longer periods of time and then just like other areas like flexible working so people can uh sorry is is, are you, is what you're saying that one hand wasn't talking to the other so as numbers of ambulance staff were going up people are dealing with the call handlers no, no, didn't so realize what, that they also had to respond to that no, so what we've been investing in from an ambulance point of view is additional paramedics and paramedic technicians to help and support getting more ambulances uh, ambulance hours deployed out on the road. The people that are uh, responding to the 111 calls, the call handlers, go through a, they, they're, not, they're not paramedics, they go through a training period and then they go and work within our call centres and they're able to answer uh, you know, tr- triage calls using our pathway tools and they can arrange for a clinician to call back if they feel that the patient would benefit from that. 
and some of the people that provide that callback service are paramedics, but it's not it's not the ambulance service per se that delivers. I understand the one that, one. but clearly they're all part of the same service, and that, that you can't have one without the other. And it seems to me that they haven't been talking to each other in the way they should have been talking to each other. Uh, they're not part of the same. They're not part of the same service. Uh, I know that. On, a, but, but, but I, yeah, they're not. They're not part of the same service. But I can. I think we would all accept that if we can get the recruitment and retention in one one of the call ham handlers, which isn't the same as the ambulance workers. If we can get the call handlers in there and answering the calls, that is beneficial to. to there there seem to be increased numbers of people that are being advised to go to any &E by one 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 calls. Mm. Um, what what pressure does that put? On A and E services, and um, what if anything? Figure ten on page thirty-three is yeah. useful in this respect. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 is that being addressed as an issue? Yeah. So, so the, we know that the most accurate uh, sort of advice is given when we're able to get as much clinical advice and support as we can. We had a big program of this, particularly in paediatrics, over the winter period, and we were able to demonstrate if we could get experienced general paediatricians working as part of 111 they were able to give the help and support and advice and therefore parents weren't then feeling that they you know needed to go to to, to go to a and e so we know that clinical advice and support helps mm. uh, we do do a lot of work looking and auditing back at whether or not some of the people that were advised to go to 111 were appropriate to go to a and e or not but often that we can make that decision in hindsight once the patient's been assessed and looked at it can be very difficult for the core handlers on the phone with the information that they've got so actually i think in the majority of cases 111 is effective and is able to stream people from a and e into alternative services but it's really important that and that's why the uec recovery plan is as it is that there are alternative services that 111 can signpost people to because ultimately people are ringing because they want help so like another example of something that we did last winter that we're going to work on yeah. for this winter is acute respiratory infection hubs so people with acute respiratory infection we can keep them away from hospital and uh, book them an appointment at, at an acute respiratory hub which then prevents them needing to, to go to hospital so I think we accept you know, accept the challenge that for some people they are told to go, but it is in terms of the overall people that ring 111, it is a relatively small number. That's it. Yes, so so um, important to understand that in the scripts, the algorithms that underpin 111, um, there is a fair amount of risk aversion mm -hmm. built in because you want to ensure that if there is a if there is any doubt about whether this patient or the member of the public calling up needs to be seen by a healthcare professional, for instance, in an ED, that that, that opportunity is given. So there is something around those algorithms, and if you if you alter them, if you shift that risk aversion, then then there are consequences in terms of potential missed uh, diagnoses. So so that's an important thing to say, and that's why uh, Miss Marsh has said that on that the more clinical judgment you can get in. Uh, to assist with the underlying uh, algorithms and scripts, uh, the, the better quality of decision making you get, so putting a human component into this. But of course that is a pool of people that we are trying to recruit into several areas. They're, you know, they're typically, they could be GPs who are doing additional sessions, uh, they can be other clinicians. Uh, and we're back to the long-term workforce plan, aren't we? Because actually uh, there is a bit about trying to use the same workforce to do multiple tasks. But we all agree that the more clinical input that you can get into the 111 service, uh, the the, the, the more clinically appropriate, in a sense, decisions you will get, and it will take away some of the risk management that, that inevitably has to be done by algorithms and scripts. So, so Ms Pritchard, um, why is the ambulance service unable to meet response time targets when there are more ambulance staff than ever before? So I think, I mean, that goes back to some of the things we've been discussing before. So there are... Um, I think it's set out actually very clearly, I have to say, in the report, um, and thanks to the NAO for that, the interdependency between different parts of the system. So everything from, as Sir Geoffrey was saying before, some of the challenges with discharge that then mean that you've got uh, hospitals op op operating very high levels of occupancy, which makes it difficult to then admit patients from A&E, which then in turn means it's difficult for ambulances to offload patients into emergency departments. So you'd have seen the figures in the report that relate to ambulance handovers. That's quite an important 
important metric of whether the flow through the system is working for ambulance services um, and it's one of the things that therefore is a big area of focus around why getting the capacity right uh, is so important because we know that if we can both uh, help to improve flow at the back door but also make sure that we've got right sized capacity so we're operating at the right levels of occupancy the whole system will be more efficient which means ambulances we will be able to hand over more quickly and in turn that of course means that then they'll be able to get to incidents more quickly so as we discussed earlier it's not just about ambulance handovers it is also about making sure that they have got the staff they need that they've got the physical ambulances so one of the elements of the UEC recovery plan urgent emergency care recovery plan was about actually additional ambulances as well as additional ambulance staff and training uh, technicians to support paramedics so you've got the right workforce there in the round uh, to support response times yeah, if I could just move on to um, looking at the A&E department's uh, target to admit, transfer or discharge 95% of patients within four hours. <coughs> uh, so Chris, how effective is your oversight of NHSC when A&E departments have not met the four-hour target for the last eight years? Um, well, as I say, we work incredibly closely with our uh, <laughs> colleagues at uh, uh, NHSE, <laughs> and uh, we have a completely shared analysis uh, of what the challenges uh, are and um, and uh, of what the <coughs> solutions are. So, the very fact of having an emer urgent and emergency care plan that is agreed between government uh, and the NHS, uh, which has in it a set of clear uh, trajectories uh, that. Um, we well, the government holds the NHS to account for is the absolute heart of that system and is replicated in the primary care plan and in the uh, 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 electives uh, plan. Um, so there isn't a difference in analysis uh, uh, between us. Um, as I think we said, at the moment, the uh, uh, NHS is on trajectory on that uh, plan, um, but we recognise all the challenges in doing uh, the next bit, and as I say, we talk about these things yeah. uh, several times a week. But just to be clear about what that conversation is, um, and it goes with the whole sort of um, integrated care board philosophy, um, it, we are focused on joint problem solving. You know, there is an accountability element. We do expect the NHS to hit targets that it's um, uh, uh, that it's signed up to. But our major conversations is, right, we've got X problem. What is it that we can do between us uh, to solve that problem? And if it's a problem with an individual local authority, then it may be on our side of the line to solve. And if it's a problem with a particular trust, then it will be on the NHS's side. So there is an accountability element, but the vast majority of our conversation is problem solving. Well, do you have a clear idea now uh, that there are enough beds in the right places? Um, well, as a um, uh, component uh, of the plan, as uh, uh, Amanda was describing, there was a sort of right-sizing bit, part of which is adding hospital beds and part of which is uh, uh, virtual uh, wards. The analysis, I mean, it was all, the analysis was all done by the NHS, entirely shared uh, with us, and we agree with the uh, assessment. Uh, the challenging bit goes back to what we were saying earlier, is those really tough systems what's the individual plan by system so right at the second that is the conversation between us and our uh, nhs colleagues we agree the overall plan yeah. and the trajectories are being hit we agree that we're targeting the right systems but what is the answer per system is what uh, uh, is our sort of shared bit of analysis at the moment thank you yeah if i could just uh, have a little look at some post uh, COVID-19. Um, in what ways is COVID-19 still affecting access to uh, and the performance of unplanned or urgent care services? I note that uh, uh, the NAO report says that absence rates in the NHS workforce have been higher following the pandemic than they were before. Yeah, I'm not ask uh, uh, Professor pa Powers. Professor to, uh, Powers yes. yeah. uh, well, um, I think clearly the position at the moment is better than it was during the winter. Um, Amanda acknowledged that earlier. We uh, have around a thousand patients in 
hospital, I don't have the figures in front of me, but staff absences due to COVID are obviously going to be less because uh, one, uh, COVID uh, is less prevalent in the community and two, we've actually changed uh, some of the uh, testing regimes that we had in place during the height of the pandemic. Uh, but there are clearly long-term effects from both the pandemic in terms of the well-being of NHS staff that we've talked about earlier. Uh, we do, uh, some of our staff are unfortunately impacted by long COVID as well. So uh, we do have some issues uh, ongoing uh, coming out of the pandemic. Um, have been absence this, rates? Uh, I haven't got the specific absence rates in front of me for COVID. The average rate of absence between April 2009 and February 2020 was 4.2% compared with 5.1% between March 2020 and October 2022, with the rate standing at 5.6% in October 22. I, I thought you were asking me about the latest figures, which we, we do have. And we can uh, February 23 absence figure is 5%. So, so still, so uh, it is down, but still higher than uh, 22. That's correct. Yes, because we've been seeing some ongoing uh, effects, and and of course, you know what we're worried about as we get into this winter, uh, that we Sorry, will. See how can ongoing effects be worse than what was going on during the pandemic? That absence would be worse now than during the pandemic. Mm. Well, I think we are. Um, well, we're definitely seeing. Um, um, as we come out of this winter, we've seen the ongoing effects of COVID infections. I'd, I'd have to have look yeah, specifically well, at the so Do you want me to jump yeah, in on this on. one? Because it relates a bit to, I think, to what we were talking about earlier. So within the within what why people are off sick, it is, as I said earlier, three big reasons. So musculoskeletal issues, that's been a long-standing issue across the health service for as long as I can certainly remember. Uh, the things that have gone up, specifically are respiratory conditions, that includes COVID. So that goes up and down a bit, um, depending as exactly as Professor Power says, on the level of COVID circulating in the general community. Um, but the third is mental health. And it is worth saying that I think um, there was, a, as we've all discussed, an extraordinary response across the NHS during COVID. Mm -hmm. And people, I mean, thank you for, for your comments on this earlier, uh, Mr. Francois, but people did do the most extraordinary things on a personal and a professional level. Mm -hmm. But that does have a long-term impact. That's well understood. It's not just in this country that we're seeing that. And so we are seeing some of that in the current sickness figures. Uh, so that is one of the reasons why the focus that we've talked about today so much about how do we look after our staff how do we make sure that they are and you know got lots of work to do on this that they really are as well supported as possible is so important thank you and finally, finally chair if i may um uh the nao report at paragraph uh, seven and nine looks at the uh, numbers of nhs staff and the spending on the nhs so um, in paragraph 7 it says full-time equivalent staff in the NHS workforce increased from 32% from the low 10 years ago to an all-time high of 1.275 plus thousand in February 2023. Uh, I found that over that period the population of the country increased by uh, 5%. Uh, and then spending uh, on the NHS uh, budget, um, total budget in 22-23 is 152 to spot six billion, some 28.4 billion more than 2617. So we've had this huge increase in staff, this huge increase in money. Um, it hasn't been enough to stop the decline in performance. So what else is to be done? Uh, Sir, Sir Chris. Oh, 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 oh Miss Pritchard, Miss Pritchard. We could probably take this one together. So, thank. Uh, so, in terms of what we're doing, I think it is all the things that we've talked about today. Uh, we talked earlier about the fact that, of course, the urgent emergency care recovery plan isn't in isolation. There's an elective recovery plan. There's a primary care access recovery plan. We've just published the long-term workforce plan. So I think we've been really clear about what the areas are that were most impacted by the pandemic period. I think Professor Powers said, and I've quoted it to this committee before, right at the beginning, that it was going to be at least a five-year journey from the very peak of that very acute level of pandemic response but the recovery was 
going to take time. So we are only part way through that, but we've been really clear what the areas are that uh, the public rightly want us to prioritise in terms of recovery. And I should say that doesn't mean we're ignoring mental health or ignoring, uh, when we talk about elective, that obviously includes cancer, but it doesn't mean we're ignoring maternity services or children and young people, but we are being very clear what it is that we need to focus the energy and effort on. And we've set out, I think, very clearly what the steps are that we're taking at the moment. Um, you know, there is a huge amount to do, but the good news is we are on track with the actions that were set out in the plan. And at the moment, if we look at the latest figures, we talked about this earlier on uh, briefly, we have seen improvement across yep. the board, not just since winter, but actually if you look at this time, uh, so if you look at the latest figures in May, those are the latest published figures against uh, May last year, you can see that there has been improvement. So I think uh, what we feel is we're now able to say quite clearly that the things that we have been doing are beginning to make a difference, but we've got uh, a very clear set of actions, both for this winter and beyond, to put us in well, we'll yeah. to and then a more sustainable I mean, the bit, over the so, so, so the bit I'd add is the bit that goes beyond the uh, NHS. So when, yeah. when we look internationally, um, demand for health, of course, the OECD goes up at about 4% a year. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, and it's largely driven, obviously, by ha ha how many old people do you have rather yeah. than yeah. total population. Yeah. Uh, so how are you going to meet that? Quite clearly, some of it has to be increasing, uh, increasing supply. Some of it has to be productivity, as we discussed earlier. Some of it has to be public health, i.e. reducing that 4% demand. And then some of it has to be uh, technology. Uh, to, so if we're going to meet that sort of relentless 4% a year, basically it's going to come, have to come out of those four things. And could I add, because we started with the demographics about us getting older, and clearly we're all getting older all the time, but, but it, is, it is the underlying trend. So in the 15 years that the workforce plan covers, we anticipate, uh, I think it's the ONS figures, 55% uh, increase in the number of people over 85. Those are, that's part of the population, often with more than one condition, um, yeah. uh, require yeah, more I mean, health we, we, we know the metrics, so yeah. I'm and, not trying to... Just and the, and saying the saying international comparison right, is valid yeah. as well. We're not the only system around the world under pressure when it comes to... Well, we know, we're we're, we're here to ask questions about how you're going to deal with that pressure. So we get, know, we get but, that the pressure's there. But these are... I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll say, you know, the, the, yeah. well, what exactly the right balance is, yeah. but there isn't a fifth component. No, it's going to be in those four spaces. I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, the other thing that we can do, of course, is prevention. Yes, and the more yes, we can get yes, upstream of some of these conditions, health, yes. and the, the, the more healthier lives, uh, years of life we can give people, yeah. then ultimately the less pressure it will yeah, I think, put I think on. we've heard you passionate on this before, Professor. Uh, Harris, and therefore I want to remind you again. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 well, and well landed. I think, we, I think we share your passion, and we do like passionate uh, people on this committee. We like people who give us answers on numbers as well. Um, so, Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Um, Mr. Pritchard. You just heard uh, Sir Chris lay out his four areas of improvement. I'm going to give him a fifth in a minute, but let's just stick with the four areas. Um, technology. Um, you were present, I think, at our hearing on uh, digitalising the NHS and the need to get more people to do that. But I wonder whether you have, in specifically, thinking about my questions on ambulance trusts, we've had evidence from the NHS providers uh, regarding population health analytics and it says they have heard from one ambulance trust how they used innovative population analytic methods allowed them to identify drivers of high demand and work with their integrated care colleagues to put in place preventative measures. This builds on previous example of ambulance trusts using their insight and patient data. Now I suspect when I come on um, in a minute to ask Sir Chris the difference between the best and the worst health trust, that this sort of advanced analytics would help uh, ambulance trusts, and particularly the South West Ambulance Trust, to, to come up nearer to the best. Yes. So, I mean, look, it's, thank you for giving, uh, for, for giving uh, time just to come back to this, because you're, I mean, if we're talking about the things that are going to enable, I completely agree with uh, Sir Chris's characterisation, if you're thinking bigger picture about what it's going to take for population as a whole uh, to be able yep. to be supported to be healthier and then to get our demand supply. The question was particularly about this, right. this, this On tech, yeah. 
that is a critical enabler of productivity. So if we actually want to operate as a really modern health system, then clearly we are going to need to have not just the technical underpinning. So good news, we are on track to have nine out of 10 trusts with an EPR uh, by the end of the year. EPR. Bad news, that's nine out of EPR, 10, EPR, not 10 sorry, out of 10, EPR. I'm so sorry, electronic patient record. record. Course, yeah. So if we're talking about some of the things that you would really like to be able to do, like AI, uh, Professor Powers mentioned it earlier, you have to be able to build on something that's already digital, not build on something that's paper. And perfectly obvious point. Uh, but the more that we can put some of those building blocks in place and then, your point, have the data that then allows us to identify as we are and as the best ICSs, so that's the integrated care systems, they're uh, uniquely well placed to operate in partnership between NHS, local government, community, uh, voluntary sector to understand their population and then be able to design services which are going to meet their needs. So a great example you've just given around ambulance trust and it underpins a lot of what's in the urgent emergency care uh, plan is understanding your population and then being able to put in place those services that are the upstream prevention but also the yeah. community response yeah. that prevents people well, from We all know the theory. It's all the question. I think Sir Jeffrey wanted to know why it's not happening but Sir Jeffrey back yes. <laughs> Why isn't it happening? <laughs> so it is, but I think my, uh, my sort of strong view would be that we need to continue to uh, invest in technology. We need to continue, as we are, for example, with the federated data platform to invest in putting the data systems in place that are then going to enable us to really exploit the benefit of actually having the data and the technological underpinnings to allow us to become that really modern health system. But we are doing it. It is already paying dividends. And I think the challenge will be just to continue that journey. Yeah. When we, I mean, again, when we looked internationally, and this went into a lot of the thinking that created uh, integrated care systems in the first place, uh, we saw quite a lot of examples around the world of where places had done population health yeah, analysis yeah. well. Mm -hmm. What we didn't see uh, was people being able to do it at scale. And as far as we could um, analyze the difference between doing it at scale um, and the sort of localized examples we said was all in the data. So it was all in the very practical of yeah. could you put together the data sets okay. and analyze them at scale so you can do the intervention okay. at exactly the right moment. Now, there are lots of good and bad things about the UK system, but actually being a, this is one of the areas where we ought to have an international uh, advantage if we can get the data yes. curation right, which is why it is in the federated data platforms yes. and all the things that we're talking about. It's not a big philosophical question. We went to, we went to visit. We went to yes. visit to Denmark and see how they do data. They yeah, well, so again, yeah. they do it very well but at everyone, small scales, yes, yeah, yeah. as it were. Yeah. Um, very few people have succeeded in doing it at a sort of the levels we're trying it at. So it is a big challenge, but it's all in the yeah. practical yeah. bits, okay, not I'm in the just, philosophy. I'm just aware of, uh, so Jeffrey needs to come in again. So Jeffrey. Come. So, Sir Chris, you've just walked into my next question. <laughs> okay, um, am I allowed to retreat again? Rather, <laughs> rather, rather timidly, like David and Goliath, can I suggest to you there might be a fifth category that you uh, yeah, yes, you can. your form? I'd be delighted if there is. Um, and it's this. Yeah. In virtually all the metrics that we've been talking about today, including um, uh, Marc Francois's bureaucracy, but I would add critically to that digital, if in every single trust, we brought the worst closer up to the best. It would completely transform the health service. Mm. What can be done about that? Uh, to, uh, well, um, uh, that I mean, that's clearly. I, I, I'd still say that's in the fore because that is very central to the productivity question, uh, which is um, uh, to, uh, clearly at the uh, 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 clearly at the heart uh, of uh, uh, of this. Um, Tackling variability is clearly one of the biggest uh, priorities, and it's how you got uh, to the tiering system uh, in the first place. That is all about the variability, and it's all about the uh, uh, can we import the best we practice. That. We know it's all now, about the variability, yes. but how are we going to solve that variability? Well, we, we're going to solve yeah. it with specific programs of work. Um, so the GERF program, which you will be familiar that. with getting it right first time, uh, the core tenet of that, of course, is, is absolutely what you said, is, is identifying variation and then working 
uh, hands on with those organisations that are performing less well uh, to get them up to the, the position of the better trusts. Um, similarly, uh, a lot of our improvement work is uh, designed and we've just uh, launched a new um, improvement programme within uh, the NHS in England is, is around identifying that variation and ensuring people have got the improvement tools that they need uh, to improve the tiering approach that uh, uh, that Miss um, Marsh uh, mentioned, which is around uh, identifying those. That for this, it's around systems rather than just individual trusts uh, that are performing at the <coughs> worst end. Uh, it's around putting in the additional support that they need in order to bring them up to, to the better end. Uh, of course, the caveat is there'll always be some people below average and there'll be some people above average. Don't need to tell you that, but, uh, but moving the whole curve upwards uh, and, and um, trying to reduce the um, the outliers uh, is absolutely what we're, yeah. we're trying to do. Uh, the bit I would add, uh, and again it goes into the think, thinking that went into the integrated care systems, is, is the right balance of national versus local. Yeah. So this report, this committee has reported yeah. a lot on you know, the big set piece, let's do it everywhere programs and how that has not worked work, for yeah. a variety of reasons. No, there think, clearly are places yeah. for national yeah. interventions. One at a time, yeah. But yeah. there's yeah. also... We, we understand that, yes. that the postcode lottery is both good and bad. The, the, the other difference we've point. made from probably a year ago is, is what I've just hinted at, that we have moved from focusing on specific organisations to a much more focus on systems, recognising that, you know, in Gloucestershire, you've... Uh, we're very familiar with. It's not just what the trust does, it's what the system around yeah. it does, yeah. uh, including the ambulance yeah. service, but also including local government. So, so our focus much more is on, is on helping systems to, in, okay. to increase performance and reduce variability yeah. than necessarily just individual Thank organisations. You, so, so it's just walked into my next question. <laughs> as long as he answers it, that's fine. Good. Good. Ah. Good. Um, the Better Care Fund. Yep. A lot of money. Yep. And it is designed to do exactly what the professor's just been describing, yep. to make different parts of the system work better. Yep. And it's presumably helping the integrated care boards. Yes. The problem with it is it's quite a lot of money, but often the different parts of the health service don't receive notification of what they're going to get until rather late in the day. Mm. And then they would be able to plan much better if they could have earlier warning of what they were going to get. Uh, yeah, I agree with that absolutely. Um, now, the um, uh, the uh, uh, the autumn statement and the Chancellor's announcement around this has hopefully given people uh, a uh, a clearer planning uh, basis. But I agree with the first of your question completely. Might the Better Care Fund help the question I was asking earlier, which is the uh, shortfall of 165,000 posts in social care? And this whole thing, that a lot of what has taken the discussion up today, uh, melding, if you like, social care better in working with the health service, is, is there more <coughs> we could do with the Better Care Fund and the integrated care boards to solve this problem? Uh, undoubtedly, yes. So um, at, uh, the, um, the integrated care boards are very new. Uh, they're in quite different places depending upon their history. Some are very mature. Um, and the style of working that you're describing is well entrenched. Others are much more uh, in, the, uh, 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 in the development phase. But uh, the only thing I'd add is there are... The, the, uh, to take your Gloucester example, there were two issues going on there. There is what is the base funding provided for adult uh, social care, you know, the uh, roughly 21 billion that is raised by local taxation that goes into the system. Uh, and then there's the couple of billion we put on top, which is much more normally much, much more focused on that adult social care uh, health uh, interface. Um, which is where the integrated care boards come in. But the base investment in, as it were, the underlying system uh, is essential to make that work. So while, while, while the joint money is very important, what is the base level of the service and therefore the government's additional investments there? Um, I, think, I, I, I think if representatives of local government were sitting here, they would say that bit um, is considerably more important than the joint bit because it's what's the quality of the underlying surf service. Um, who is going to be responsible for overseeing the work of the integrated care boards given that they're not entirely a health 
uh, creation, they are partly health and partly local government, <coughs> who's going to be overseeing their work, their critical work? Right, so we have not changed the, um, the, the basic legals, as you know, yeah. so social care remains a primary responsibility of um, uh, local government. Uh, but, um, uh, so the ICBs will work, um, they will certainly work best, but they work largely as a joint venture between two independent uh, bodies. And as I say, where relations are mature, that works uh, much uh, better. Uh, the thing we have changed, um, which was uh, in the uh, uh, Health and Care Act uh, that we've just uh, passed, is uh, for basically the first time um, we um, have um, uh, inspection oversight of uh, um, uh, local government commissioning via CQC, uh, and we have compulsory data collections uh, so that we have a much better knowledge of the base knowledge of uh, what is being done in social care. So we have taken steps to create greater national oversight, both of the joint work and the uh, base work, but in a system where it is still you know, the responsibility of elected local councillors to be responsible for that uh, money. We haven't changed that. We have taken as a uh, piece of principle that both we and local government want to see things get better and want to solve these problems. And the ICB structure is to give a basis for you know, people who want to work together and want to solve these problems to do so, I wouldn't want to suggest it's we'll a sort of top-down system well. in the way that we have on the NHS. Chris, thank you. I'm more worried about the people who don't want to work together, but we'll come to that another day, I'm sure. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you, you very much, much. Jeffrey. Very, 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 very quickly, well. so much of this comes down to the quality of leadership at local level. Yep. Most trust chief executives last 18 months or less now. What are you doing to reverse that? A, to improve the quality of leaders, but B, to keep them in place for longer? Um, well, we had, a, well, we had a discussion last time you were uh, here around the, uh, the leadership review, which I thought, uh, as, uh, as you uh, yeah. uh, identified, has an awful lot of um, sensible uh, recommendations uh, in it. Uh, do you want to talk Ms. about... Ms. Pritchard, you're, you're, you're at top this uh, system. Yeah, no, happy to. Thank you. You were a chief executive, um, both with two former chief executives. Indeed, yes. Um, I was thinking specifically of hospital chief executive. Yes, yeah. 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 so you're, um, I mean, you'll be aware, I think, that during the pandemic, we had very little turnover of hospital chief executives. Indeed, across the NHS, people just yeah. got stuck in. Since, uh, I think, we've now hit the recovery phase, which is you know, extremely hard work, uh, we have seen much more... Uh, uh, movement mm. in chief executives. So we've got, uh, I think, um, two things worth mentioning and then something else. So the first is, there's a real question, I think, that we've been grappling with for many years now about how to make sure we've got the right pipeline of people with real talent. Uh, and that is, you know, this is one of my favourite subjects, not just people who have come up through a general management route, but they might be doctors, they might be nurses, they might be therapists, they might be accountants who've come through and indeed we have many people who come through different routes to chief executive level and we developed a program a number of years ago called an aspiring chief executive program and that's been very successful in helping to develop people so they've got the skills mm -hmm. so that we're setting people up to succeed rather than setting people up uh, without that support and um, second thing is we've got uh, with the the brilliant uh, work that uh, Sir Gordon Messenger and Linda Pollard did in their review a really clear set of recommendations around not just just chief executives or indeed not just executive teams but actually the whole of uh, the leadership management across the NHS but we've taken those recommendations and we are um, actually I think we're starting in a range of different ways including induction so both ends but one of the things that we are doing as an urgent and early priority is putting the framework in place to ensure that chief executives have got both an ability to self-assess and be assessed about how they are doing and then access the support they need so with a structured for example uh, newly um, appointed chief execs program that already exists but we're enhancing that with coaching mentoring um, with uh, also sort of buddying with more established chief executives so you can help people uh, to make sure that they're just um, they've got somewhere to go if things are proving more okay, difficult. We've got, so we've got, got a system. whole range of things in place. So, so it's in your there. mind and you're doing hard yeah, work to get. Okay. I think yep. it's just the third thing to say though is this is also where systems matter because yep. it's I think we've got it, we've heard that we've heard a lot about yeah. it and we I think we've got that very loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> got it. So Sorry. I want to turn, Sorry. if I may, just right. briefly to before we finish to Sarah J. Marsh and Professor Powis. Right. It's your baby, Ms. Marsh. You've come in You've given up your hospital to come and work uh, in, in NHS England. Um, so it's a big step. And you're six months on. 
uh, in delivering on this programme, how, how confident are you that you're on track to sort out urgent and emergency care? So I think you can see the challenge uh, in front of us is significant. I think the UEC recovery plan is the right plan for the next 12 months to stand us in really good stead. Uh, We've both got the investment in the additional things that we've talked about, extra beds, ambulances, virtual wards and so on, but also changing the way we work, trying to keep more people at home rather than bringing them to hospital. And we can see the early signs of success. We have seen improved performance uh, during the course of the year, particularly in April and May, and that's compared to the previous April and May. But I don't think we're remotely complacent about the winter that we've got ahead. We know we're going to face risks. Some of those are known. We don't know what the precise nature of COVID and flu. I think we've got early indications from the Southern Hemisphere that it might be a challenging flu season. We've also potentially got industrial action, which brings with it some uncertainty. So I feel really confident in the plan we've set out and the actions we're taking, but I don't think that it would be when fair. When it hits the real world. When it hits the real world, there's an awful lot of challenge this winter. But I think our team, you know, the commitment is there to absolutely be focused. Between you, today. I mean, which targets are most at risk? Then, I mean, you've, you hit, you've outlined some of the external challenges. Which targets in the plan are most at risk? I think the most challenging one from uh, my perspective is the 30-minute ambulance uh, response time because that's got many factors that, you know, or the whole system needs to work for that to work. Uh, As I say, we're absolutely focused on all the actions that we can do both inside the ambulance uh, service itself and the ED department department and beyond to, to do it. I'm confident we'll do better. Uh, that we did last winter but obviously we want to achieve this but I think it's you know it is going to be tight but we are managing You mean particularly for, is that particularly for winter you worry about? Uh, yeah, yeah it, it, it's over the winter over, period uh, yeah, and then what that does because the way the target's measured is for the year as yeah, a whole yeah, yeah. so I think we will So winter to, winter is one of your big areas of it, it, It's just okay. the resilience of winter yeah. and I think it's particularly in the systems that we've t- talked yeah. about here so we might be able to achieve it in England overall but we need to be able to do that consistently in some of our more fragile yeah. systems I think that's the I'm thing that we're talking about winter in July rather than yeah, November. So I talk um, about it every day, to be honest. Well, well, <laughs> Professor Powers, anything yeah. to add? To be honest, I thought you were going to say Sarah Jane had given up the hospital chief executive job for the opportunity of appearing before the public accounts committee. <laughs> uh, but that was yeah. another perk of I the job. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Job. Uh, but, but, so this is my sixth winter coming up, I think, yeah. since I started in the job. And my, re- my uh, reflections would be this year we have started earlier than ever yeah. before. Uh, so we actually started, I think, you know, January and February a bit of this odd, year. That we always start yeah. talking about winter. So, so we, are, we are well ahead in our thinking, and I think, importantly, systems are well ahead in their thinking as well. Uh, so we're really focused on in getting things in place as much as possible by September, October, rather than a last-minute dash to do it as we go into winter. Um, I think we are doing the right things. Uh, we've got a, a list of things, virtual wards, uh, one of them, uh, investment in ambulance services, focus on discharge. I think it's all the right things. Uh, yes, there is variation, as you said, and we've got to focus on supporting those that are doing worse at the moment and get, get them into a better place. Uh, but having said all of that, um, the winter will be challenging. Uh, winters are always challenging. The demographics, uh, as we've said, are not um, going in our favour. Uh, uh, last winter was particularly unusual because it was the first winter out of COVID and rest- restrictions. Uh, so we had Group A strep out of season. We've had RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, out of season. We had COVID and flu occurring simultaneously, the twin yeah, we, we, we remember centre. the pressures. And, so, yeah. so this winter, I hope, will be a little bit less unusual, but we will still have COVID and flu. And as Sarah <coughs> Jane has said, the season in Australia is, has been another early season, so their flu season started early in their winter this year. Uh, in, the, in the last two flu seasons we've had, actually in the 2018-19 and in last year, we had a December peak, which is a bit more unusual, it's usually January. So we could get an early flu uh, peak again. It, could still be a significant peak and it could occur simultaneously with COVID and there's no doubt that that will put pressure on us that we haven't seen in the in the years pre-COVID uh, and with, with all those underlying demographic changes okay, which so have still, not changed. So you put in all the caveats so, a lot so, of um, So yes I think we, we are doing everything that we can uh, but still uh, you know we will okay. need a 
better winter. Uh, and of course, the public always do their bit by using services sensibly uh, and getting vaccinated because actually, okay, let's not forget, the vaccine programs will also start. So good one to finish on, Professor Powers. Uh, um, and on the vaccine side, there's some good news and yep, there's an RSV yep. vaccine. Uh, so we're looking to see, along with colleagues at DH, uh, so the messages. when we can start that. If the NHS get vaccinated, is it? All right. uh, that is always the message we end on when it right. comes to September, October, November, COVID vaccines, flu vaccines, if you're eligible, say, because that's what I, the public can do. To some help of the members of the committee, winter. I think a number of us in the anyway, but good to be over 50 in terms of vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> Never has it been such a good time. Can I thank you very much indeed for your time? The transcript of this session will be available on the website uncorrected in the next couple of cases. Thank you very much to our colleagues at Hansard for that. Um, and we will be producing a report on this subject uh, in the autumn. Uh, order, order.